Welcome to Zero Page Homebrew, your best source for the newest Atari games and the hottest ZPH broadcast studio. <laughs> it's very warm Literally. today. <laughs> so if we get a little shiny. Yeah, in the face. That's why. It's 32 degrees Celsius. Outside. Uh, and uh, whatever that is in American. I'm not yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> but today... We are very excited because yes. we have a developer spotlight that we do from time to time mm. on uh, important, prolific um, members of our community that have made amazing games. Atari's excited too. And tonight we have Atarius Maximus, Steve Engelhart. Yay. Um, and we're going to be playing some, uh, well, Tanya specifically is going to be playing some 7800 and 2600 games. Woohoo! 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Thank you, Carl G. For translating that to American. Freedom uh, units. Freedom units. <laughs> F stands for freedom units. Um, but first, I want to thank all the Twitch subscri subscribers who help support the show. Oh, it's fill up with water. Okay. 8-Bit uh, Poet Alnifer. Might be a good time to do it right now. Okay. You you give okay. you give the names? 8-Bit Poet Alnifer, Andrew Atari, Armscar Coder, Atari 800, XL Rules, Atari New 74, Atari Age. Tarius Maximus, who's that? BR Pocock, Bruno Stag, Captain Classic, Charles Donnie Mal, Charles Willen, Shitlilla, Sirene, Reboot, Dianoi, Danny C, Dr. Mukaz, Dr. Webstore, Gamma Dev, Grey Defender, Ground Trooper, Heraldo Ju, JGKSPSX, Johnny WC, uh, 23rd Carl G, Karakak, Karako, 2600, Veltifer, Lambda Express, Mad Max, Mandy Sipping T, Mark Yannis, Mark Space, Sig, Metal Atari, Mick Muse, Mike Soul, Mike Tal, Miss Command, MTK Smith, Mr. Funst, Mr. Fix, Muddy Funster, and Nathan Strum, Neo Mina, a Nostalgic 26, Pseudographis, Korg 2600, Renner Ghost, Repentless VG, Reventuli, Ricardo Pim, Six Sweet, Smitty B, Spice for S, Spin, Spinley, S. Ramirez, the D Train, Tiki Dan K, Teak Foes, Trek MD, Tweeny, Vexorex, VVG Double Down, XNX, Zombie Alice, and thank you for following Zeptari. Uh, I guess a lot of people are anticipating this uh, interview because we had so many people follow on Twitch in the past 24 hours. So that's that's really awesome. Yeah, did something change in the studio or am I just imagining it? Tanya stepped out. There's an empty spot here. Uh, but if you want to support the show and support this cat uh, for just pennies a day, uh, you can subscribe to uh the channel or if you can if you just want to know when we're on you can just follow and it'll pop up on your phone or wherever you've allowed the pop-ups to be tanya's coming back and everything will be back to normal no something did oh thank you jedekai huh for yeah. that 100 bits uh i took down the speakers on the side um so i am changing around the office i think that's mostly what you'll be able to see but i'm gonna put a new desk and bunch of other stuff in here that yeah. you won't, won't see won't be too obvious to on the on screen but yeah 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 so that's, Some that's the big thing light light renovating renovating in the 90 yeah. degree heat so light yeah. very <laughs> light um but do we have anything else i don't think so i, I usually forego any kind of news when yes. we do interviews because yes, yes, we don't yes. want to make them wait longer than they already have to mm -hmm. do um so Without further further ado, mm -hmm. um, this prolific developer has been creating Atari 2600 and 7800 games for over 20 years in the homebrew scene, including 42 Atari 2600 hacks, 19 Atari 7800, 26 Atari 2600 games, demos, and other programs that include such titles as Cave-In, Dungeon Stalker, Drone Patrol, and Death Merchant. Please welcome to... Zero Page Homebrew for his developer spotlight, Steve Engelhart, Atarius Maximus. Yay. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Let me just turn up the volume here. I cranked it down. Yeah, thank you for coming on uh, the show. It is an honor to have you on the show after playing so many of your games over the years uh, <laughs> on the show. It's great to always talk to the developers themselves mm -hmm. and get a little bit more insight into what motivates them to make the games that they do and and i just love talking to developers whether it's over uh skype or if it's in person and uh we met you last year in person at prge which was awesome and i'm gonna turn up your volume just one second yeah that's mm -hmm. better. it is just <laughs> adjusting things here it's, everything's a little bit different so 
Welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, I started with a marathon session of looking at all the old uh, developer spotlight shows that you've done. Amazing work uh, by, by you and... Uh, <laughs> Well, yeah, they're the ones who do all the work. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just show it off. So it, it's, it's great to have such talented community members and to talk to them and to give them uh, a stage to talk because a lot of them don't. You know, some of them get interviewed here and there, mm -hmm. but um, I try and interview as many as possible. So let's just start with you and your nickname, Atarius Maximus. <clears throat> Sounds Roman. Yeah. Um, so where did that come from? Is it a um, fan of Monty Python, or is it uh, some from somewhere else? I mean, it was something uh, referencing the biggest dickus on the uh, <laughs> the movie. It's actually something that yes. shows pretty quickly. Um, I joined Atari Age in August two thousand two, and uh, at that time, I think I had just bought the uh, Russell Pro Movie Gladiator, and uh, I really enjoyed uh -huh. it. So I, Maximus was a handle I was using on other sites. And I thought I'd stick Atarius in front of it because it just sounded cool. But again, I made that decision in about 30 seconds when I registered. So not a lot, not a lot of thought was put into that. Yeah. <laughs> so it was just on a whim. It wasn't something that you used before on like BBSs <laughs> or other messaging boards. No, this was something new I created for Atari Age you know, like 22 years ago. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Been it been a while. It's an iconic name, though I have to say. <laughs> it's, it's very memorable. Memorable. Yeah. It's, it stands out, and of course, it has Atari in it, so our cat is very appreciative of that. Yeah. There um, you go. <laughs> so, you joined in two thousand two Atari the Atari Age forums, mm -hmm. but when does your programming uh, journey begin? I I assume it's before that mm -hmm. in various languages, various computers. Um, did you take it in school? Um, no, I've never actually taken any uh, computer-related classes in school. I, I have a bachelor's degree in psychology, believe it or not. But uh, it, it all oh. started uh, probably when I was 13. I got my first Commodore 64. So I would stay up all night typing a code from nice. Computes Gazette and learn how to write my own games yeah. in BASIC. And that went up for many years until I got my first PC in the early 90s. And I started with Visual yeah. BASIC. So I've been a Visual BASIC and .NET developer as, as a hobby for several decades too i've made i've actually been paid to make some games and or apps in uh, net so i have a little bit of experience there but i've never actually been a programmer for a job okay mm. but you did get paid mm. you can technically can call yourself a pro <laughs> professional programmer <laughs> and of course your games have sold on atari age so yeah. you yeah. can definitely call yourself a professional programmer um so you took us through a little bit of the computers and computer platforms um, so what about the, on the gaming side of things growing up, what kind of say consoles, like maybe some Atari consoles did you have besides the Commodore 64, or even at friend's house? Cause I, both of us had a Commodore 64 mm -hmm. growing up. She had an NES too. I didn't have any consoles. Mm -hmm. I'm making up for lost time in this room. If, <laughs> if you ever see it, there's a lot of consoles say, here. So maybe step in us the through. late seventies. Uh, I'm, I'm 53. I was born in 1970. So late seventies, I was, you know, eight, nine years old. Um, I, we didn't have any consoles at home until 82. My, my parents finally bought me one, but my friends had an Atari 400 and an Atari 2600. So I would have to go to their houses to play. Um, but yeah, right. when, I, when I got my own, I guess it was Christmas of 82 and, you know, I got Space Invaders probably with it and my gosh, yeah, I ended up probably having 12 to 15 games or so as a kid when all was said and done. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, you know, I got that Commodore in 83, I guess. So really it was the Atari 2600 yeah. and the Commodore 64 that were my childhood consoles. Same, same here. I didn't have a Atari 2600, but a lot of my friends did, and I went over to their houses and played their games. So I did a lot of exposure for the 2600. Of course, almost everybody did in that era because that was the gaming console. Yeah. You know, you had one-offs with the ColecoVision or Intellivision, but the majority had the 2600. Mm. Yeah. Um, covered um, a little bit of this when you started programming. Um, so maybe talk us a, a little bit about before we get into the modern programming era what kind of games did you make on the commodore 64 they were all basic games <clears throat> it's, it's funny yeah when i when i ran the site yars.com which I, I shut down last year just because i don't know, lost interest but um yeah. I, I published some of the old games because i found them on old floppy disks archiving disks and i made a game called called nice. cave dave <laughs> when i was when i was <laughs> 12. <laughs> And uh, some oh, of nice. downloaded it, and uh, 
and uh, put it on YouTube. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, it's actually, yeah, oh, if you search goodness. for my name and Cave Dave, you'll actually see one of my very early efforts as a very young kid. <laughs> I'm a oh, that's forward. awesome. But I would, I would generally make like simple shoot 'em ups. And uh, I, that was kind yeah. of a Donkey Kong style of game that I was attempting to make. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. limitations of basic. I mean, I did what I could. I really wanted to learn assembly, I was very aware of it, but the resources weren't yeah. there. My local library didn't have any books on assembly, I didn't have any friends that did it. So I was kind of yeah. locked in to just, I didn't have access to the knowledge. That's, that's a very similar story. I did some basic games, um, but Commodore Basic is very slow uh, yes. in relation to assembly. It's just, just dog slow. <laughs> um, and I tried to learn machine language on the Commodore 64, and I bought a couple books, but they are very, very complex. Like, they didn't start really at the beginning so i found it very intimidating and i didn't get anywhere and i also had to somehow type in my own machine language compiler because i didn't have one and that was another barrier so it was very difficult yeah i mean I, I typed in programs from um i was subscribed to ahoy magazine mm -hmm. That was another magazine, not as popular as uh, Computes, Computes Gazette. Gazette. Mm. Um, but I typed in their machine language code, and it was all just hex, hex stuff. So I didn't learn anything from that. <laughs> yeah. But I, but uh, yeah, they usually did the joystick handling routine in machine language, and the rest in basic. So learned a little bit about that. So when you joined Atari, did you join in at August twenty first, two thousand two, mm. and your first post reads in part, "Hello everyone, I thought." I'd finally introduce myself as I've been reading these forums for a while now and I haven't posted anything until now. I'm the proud original owner of a 2606 Switch and 7800 that I purchased new. Well, my parents bought 2600 for me in 80 and 86 respectively. I'm up to 285 unique carts for the 2600, 70 original purchase, rest from eBay, and my 15 original from the 7800 that I bought new. Somehow my old Atari consoles and games survived all my parents' garage sales and spring cleanings, wow. which is pretty unique. That is unique. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm going to attempt to contribute to this community a little more often. I'm very impressed with how active and knowledgeable the regulars on these forums seem to be. Looking forward to hanging out more often. So when did you become aware of the homebrew community and the people that were making new games for the Atari 2600? Was it before you joined um, the Atari Age forums? Or was it kind of around that time you're like, oh my God, there's this huge community on it Atari really Age? It started off with me being interested in hacks just because it was so easy. Um, you know, I created that Adventure Plus hack. That was probably the first thing I ever shared in the forums that was uh, playable on the 2600. Um, but I really yeah. didn't get into the homebrew scene and really start learning more until uh, Fred Quimby released Atari Basic, I think, in 2005. And, uh, okay, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and that started your own programming yeah. rather than just the ha hacking of established games that were already there. Yeah, it, it really did. I mean, I, I started to dive into assembly a little bit. I, I found it quite intimidating. Um, much respect, to, I'm sure everybody says this, much respect to the real assembly programmers. It's much more difficult. <laughs> um, but, but I did yeah. end up rewriting, uh, well, it's still a hack. It's not an original game. But Adventure Plus, I did actually <laughs> go back and change it so that it's assembly code. So it can be compiled from code rather than just binary hacking it. <laughs> Right, so you, I, I assume you used a uh, disassembled code and recompiled it and changed what you need, wanted yeah, to change that, it? that was the more fun thing for me to do when I was hacking, too. There's a lot of people, especially Demis Debro, there's uh, really so many uh, uh, common oh, yeah. assemblies. So yeah, going through those and making changes and reassembling those was a lot of fun early on. And, and great for learning because he does do a lot of great commenting on his disassemblies. Yeah. Uh, which which is wonderful for people just uh, starting out and and learning really from the pros back in the days because those are the disassemblies of the you know 70s and 80s games so it's it's really really great thank you cafe to d for letting me know it's a bit quiet um, so we're gonna dive into that game you just mentioned uh, the adventure hack so let me get that booted up on the 2600. For Tanya to dive into, we can talk a little bit about that. Let me switch over. There we go. OK. 
Okay. Interesting. I haven't, so, I haven't uh, seen any recent numbers, but that Adventure Plus hack has been on sale for quite some time at the Atari H store, and it's sold by far more than anything else I've released. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably because it's been around for so long, and you know, adventure's a big uh, yeah today's today's date. Okay. Yeah, and go down to hacks. Down, 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 down. And and adventure seems to be one of the games that a lot of people love to hack, probably for nostalgic purposes, <laughs> maybe because that's uh, an early game and it's a. Uh, very well-known game and people love it um so tell us a little bit about this um this game adventure why you chose it to be one of your hacks and also how did it come to be in the atari age store as a hack because there's uh you know there's not too many hacks that are for sale in the atari age store because it has to be something that you know, contributes and stands out. Uh-oh, uh -oh. you're going to have to get the bat to get that now. Now you're bat? in trouble. Do you want me to restart it? <laughs> it'll be a little bit easier with the sword. Well, uh, how it came to be probably was just because Adventure was my favorite game as a kid. It was, uh, I didn't have very many games that were mine. <clears throat> and uh, that one I definitely put the most hours into. I mean, uh, playing on game two and game three, I could sit down and play that for an hour. <laughs> It was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah. so really it was just inspirational because it was a favorite childhood game. <clears throat> and uh, uh, that's when I just started investigating and asking questions and talking to people on the forums about, uh, you know, different ways I could potentially change it. And uh, I, I initially right. found, my gosh, way back when the only tools for hacking were uh, command line tools called Edit GFX and Show GFX. <laughs> Somebody came out with the first uh, hack oh, matic tool i think in maybe oh three ish but uh, i started off with just binary hacking it and uh that's when i started getting involved with uh, uh kurt howe uh, nikki shea who unfortunately has passed but he was a tremendous help and a tremendous yes. support uh with this hack and uh um his knowledge was instrumental um he created all kinds of hacks that you'll, you'll find in that same era when i released adventure plus that uh, added interesting things yeah when he passed, we did a uh, tribute show to Nuki Shea and played uh, some of his best uh, best hacks. And he was uh, very prolific and extremely helpful in in the uh, community. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he'd be sorely missed. And, yeah, definitely. I, I definitely miss him and interacting with him. Uh, as far as how it came to be in the store, um, mostly back then, I guess, there were more hacks, I guess, put into the store back then than there would be now. Um, I think it yeah. was more common. There were maybe maybe just more hacks than homebrews at the time, 20 years ago. <laughs> I I think that might have been been the case. It was very very sparse in the beginning. Like yeah, only a couple, you know, homebrews, original homebrews a year back then. So I think at that point it, it generated a lot of interest in the forum thread. A lot of people were liking it and commenting on it, and uh, everybody kept saying, "Is this going to be for sale?" And I think all I did was just send send, send ah. a message to Al and say, "Hey, can we put this in the store?" And he said, "Yes." That's... Well, that makes sense. Yeah, if people are calling for it, um, uh oh, see, so you don't have your sword still. I know because it's stuck. It's still in the wall. Yeah. Mm. It didn't reset. There, now try it. But the... you don't stand a chance. Oh, there you go. Yeah, good. Don't Thank drop you. it into the, the wall. The design of the game, I'll I really just to. wanted to change up the mazes. I didn't want to dramatically change the game. I just wanted it to be a, a fresh take yeah. on the same, the same old game. That, that was one of my next questions. What what kind of changes did you make? Um, and besides the maze, obviously some graphics as well. Yeah, and you know, it's funny looking at you playing it now. The sword, um, it looks like a boat anchor. I, I think I... <laughs> <laughs> it's just a big, wide sword. Yeah, I think that... I, I, I'm, I'm going to admit when you said, oh, uh, you're going to need the sword. And I went, oh, I thought it was an anchor. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's for your boat, so I don't just I thought I was anchoring a away. boat to a, to, a, to a dock or something. That's but something anyway, I that's change funny. if yeah. I did it now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have to touch it with your sword. Ah! Oh, oh. And, uh, you know, oh. I, I tried my best with the dragons, but uh, I think uh, Reverend Tooley definitely has it down better than I do. <laughs> his Dragon's Descent games and the Dragon Racer games. Yeah. Um, I also want to yeah, go back the, and have this with his, his Dragon's Racer and Dragon mm. Racers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's the dragon expert. Uh, um, 
so you noted that um, Adventure was one of your favorites as a kid. Um, so what were, what were some of your other Atari 2600 favorites back then? Well, um, that were now. I really liked Fishing Derby. That was a, I played that so much with my dad. <laughs> um, I think he bought it for me because he was a fisherman. That was his passion. So uh, I had a lot of fun playing that with my dad, and uh, I got pretty good at it. Um, we also yep. had Kaboom, and uh, that was a, a perennial favorite. Um, yeah, uh, fast-paced game. I, very difficult. Keeps you coming back for it more. Was, very quick to play. It was kind yeah. of in the same vein as Adventure. I really liked Haunted House, too. I can go back and replay that over and over again. I mean, as yeah, a, that is very Adventure-like. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, of course, the big ones. I mean, I played Asteroids a lot. I played Space Invaders a lot. And Missile Command yeah. a lot. <laughs> so, the classics. Yeah. yeah. Um, stemming from this game, you made something called Create Your Own Adventure Application, uh, an application for other people to manipulate the game. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what its capabilities are? Yeah. And what and where that came from? Um, yeah, that was really just a, something I wanted to do so that the community could create their own adventure hacks too, and similar to Adventure Plus, although it actually expands on what I was able to do. Um, I created that in Visual Basic 6 on the Windows 98 machine. <laughs> And uh, I, oh, I wow. just, just for the heck of it, I tried just last week and downloaded it. It will run on Windows 11, so it, it's oh it's great. Functional. Um, but I yep. basically that that what that program does is it, it imports the the original assembly, and uh, you yep. can in a graphical way you can make changes and visually see on the screen what you're dealing with mazes and sprites and object placement, and then it will automatically update that assembly and export it from the program, which can then be reassembled into what you saw on the screen. So, oh, very so it's nice. It's a really easy way to uh, customize a, a, your own adventure hack. And, uh, and did you did you see a lot of people using it and, and take a look at what kind of stuff they made? Did they post it in the Atari Age forums? Well, yeah, there were a fair amount of shares with that. And uh, yeah, there were some interesting creations. I think uh, it yeah. directly led to, uh, gosh, I think his name was Tony Wong, ATW Wong, on, uh, on the Atari Age forums. I do know that name. Yeah. He made the uh, Haunted Adventure. Yeah games and uh, i believe that was part of his inspiration when i <laughs> when i started making that uh create your own adventure application oh nice did, did somebody uh let's see philip meyer said weird dragon behavior did is the dragon <laughs> behavior changed at all in this uh, game no i didn't change the dragon behavior that's the, that's the original <laughs> code <laughs> There you go. You killed the dragon. Yeah. You have to get the pointy end into the dragon. There you go. That's right. Okay. So let's uh, move on to the next game that uh, you highlighted because you sent me a bunch that you thought would be good for the show and uh, they look like a good list. So we're going to go on to your second hack because you made a lot of hacks in, in the beginning. I think I, at least the list that you forwarded me, 42. <laughs> hacks some of them were of the same game that is true um but you did start doing with start uh, your programming or your 2600 adventure with hacks i did it was much more interesting for me to hack the assembly files i didn't want to just make graphics changes a lot of the ones a lot of the hacks i made were uh, were uh, well possible because of the assembly files but made more fundamental changes to the game like uh, i don't know invincibility or uh unlimited time or things that right. made it more interesting to me anyway <laughs> yeah and those those like in the disassembly those would be quite simple exactly. to find you know just do not deduct a life or you know just changing one variable so it's a good a good starting point to understand programming you go oh this is a variable it's used in these places oh if i change it like this uh, that makes this happen. Yeah, it certainly helps too, just kind of understanding the flow of an assembly working? language program. <clears throat> um, so tell us a little bit about what you changed and why you wanted to change it for this game. Um, this one was probably just good because I could, and I, I didn't have Dragster as a kid, um, but I, I got this yeah. later, I think when I was in college. At that point, there were so many thrift shops with the uh, $2 Atari games that I, I picked up a bunch and I had a lot of fun with this game and, uh, when I was probably in my early 20s. But uh, I loved the, the Dukes of Hazard show when I was a kid and uh, just, just yep. 
thought it would be kind of cool to change into the cars and stuff that would be like the Jaro Lee. And uh, it doesn't really change anything in the core gameplay of this game. It really is just a graphic hack. Um, what I thought was most interesting about this hack, it was surprised me. Uh, Atari just released yeah. the Game Station Pro, and this is one of the fucking games on the Game Station Pro. I had no <laughs> idea. That was kind of a pleasant surprise. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you about that. That's that's crazy. So, when did you find out, and how did you find out that it was included on the Game Station Pro that was released? I was reading the Atari Age forum thread about the Game Station Pro because I was uh, just curious about it. And somebody mentioned that there was a game called Drag Race on it. So I posted in that thread asking about it, and he sent a picture of a, of the, a screenshot of his screen on his TV. And I'm like, holy cow, that was, that's my hack. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Atari didn't reach out to you, didn't let you know, didn't no information whatsoever. It just appeared yeah. all of a sudden. And, obviously and, and, and by chance... By chance, you found out about yeah, I mean, it. Obviously, I have no rights to this game. I mean, it's uh, Activision code. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that was. It, yeah. it would have been kind of cool if they would have <laughs> given me a heads up. That would have been cool to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and obviously they licensed the game, and so they were able to to <clears throat> put it into the system. And um, I mean, there are uh, murky legalities of the the work you did putting into this game and the graphics that you made, but uh, I'm sure it's more of an honor than anything that they would be able to offer, if if they were able to offer anything at all to, to put it into. Yeah, no, I don't expect anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the other interesting thing, I guess, about this, and that I you probably shouldn't play it because it's kind of a buggy mess, but. Um, <laughs> Thomas Yench made, we'll move Thomas on quick. Yench made a, yeah. an auto shift hack, which I incorporated into this hack, oh. and he admitted when he posted it that it was buggy, so the, the screen rolls quite a bit. However, I was able to get a 5.44 oh, okay. using that auto shift hack that Thomas Yench created. Oh, very <laughs> nice. Good score. Yeah, <laughs> you did, yeah 5.44, so you beat, uh, beat Todd Rogers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With the hacked code, of course. It's not the right, original. It doesn't code. count. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm sure we all watched that that show where they automated the uh, the game to try and make it as fast as possible using a computer shifter, and they still couldn't uh, uh, beat that score or even uh, tie the score. I can't remember now. But, yeah, I read a lot yeah. about that too, and yeah, there was a lot of controversy surrounding Todd Rogers and his record. I know. <laughs> yeah, it it is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's interesting how heated people get about these things. But, of course, their their reputation is on the line, so mm. that that makes a lot of sense. You done with the game? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no. It's, it's, uh, it just took me a second to figure out what... what uh, yeah, one day my I'll... Uh, my shift and all one day that. I'll, <laughs> I'll have to play that, that game some more and try and get it's a good fun. score. It's fun. Once you figure it out. Um, so let's load up... Actually, yeah, let's load up the next game. And I think that was the last of the hacks game. So we're going to go into uh, Road Blaster. Road Blaster. The 2600. Um, so tell us uh, a little bit about this game. <clears throat> so I'd, um, this is when I had just discovered Atari Basic that, uh, that Fred created. And, and uh, I knew I wanted to try my hand at something. So, uh, you know, part of the problem is just coming up with any kind of idea, right, when you're trying to come up, trying to create a game. Um, I was just thinking yes. back, and I always liked driving games, and I remember playing Road Blasters at the arcade when I was a kid. And uh, I thought it might be something very possible with Atari Basic. All I needed to do is scroll some play, play field box and, <clears throat> and um, yeah. move some cars back and forth. So um, this, was, this was my <laughs> very first attempt at making a homebrew. So... Uh, I mean, if I made this now, yeah. it would be dramatically different. But it's it's fun to look back on and, and, and play. I'd, it's it's fairly simplistic. You uh, <clears throat> shoot yeah. cars that are coming at you. Occasionally, they will turn into a little health uh, <laughs> plus sign, <laughs> health pack. Yeah, and you uh, drive okay. over the health to regain your yeah. health. Yeah. Okay. And you're already healthy. That's why I wasn't doing anything. Well, yeah, yeah. The, the car yeah. will change colors as you take damage, and. Uh, yeah. And the object really is just to stay on the road as long as you can, shoot as many cars as you can, and uh, get a high score. But, yeah, a good starting, a good starting off point. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very simple. There's no, you know, flicker management or anything. You just move cars down. A score goes up. You 
with mm. the background. Uh, there's, you know, duplication of, uh, of cars, and it does destroy the correct car when you shoot that car. <laughs> yeah. So that's good, because you see some, some first-timers games, and they use duplication or triplication, and it just randomly gets rid of one of them when it hits. What made this so fun in the beginning, too, is just the amount of support I got immediately on the forums from some of the more prolific uh, homebrewers out there, too, and would support me and give me suggestions for help. And this was also, like, a, I think, Atari Basic version 0.3 Alpha or something. I mean, there was <laughs> this was at the very yeah. beginning, so there were limited options. So, uh, again, this would be vastly different if I worked on it today. I'm not going to revisit it. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it was. Uh, I was pretty proud of it for the limitations that Atari Base Basic had then, for sure. Oh yeah, I mean it's a very playable game. Mm -hmm. It has all the elements you want. You know, there's danger. They're shooting at you. You also have to avoid them physically. Um, you can survive by getting power ups back. Um, it's it's got all the basic elements, so it's a great starting point. And. You touching on the support that you got from the Atari H forums. I think that's that's a really important aspect of this community is the support and the feedback that you get. And especially from veterans of the community, knowing that this was your first game and them giving encouragement to you. Um, was that instrumental in keeping going oh, absolutely. with uh, the program? Absolutely. I mean, that's what yeah. keeps me coming back. I mean, I, obviously, I really enjoy this. It's my it's my passion and my hobby. And I, I love programming. I almost like creating games more than, than playing them. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that's but, good. Yeah, the amount of support I've got. And uh, I, I, I hate to even just mention names because I'm going to be forgetting somebody else. But uh, yeah, uh, Mike Sarna especially. I mean, he's he he maintained Atari yeah. Basic for so long, and then uh, of course created 7800 Basic. Uh, Mike has provided so much support for almost every game I've made. Whenever I have questions, he immediately responds. Just that guy in particular was, has definitely kept me coming back. Oh yeah, there's a lot of really great people mm -hmm. in in the forums. Mike Sarna, of course. Um, so let's just go back to hacks for a mm -hmm. second because I have a couple more questions. Looks, it, it looks like a number of your hacks were made to make games easier to play with things like unlimited time or unlimited lives. Uh, so some of your games are actually made harder to speed up the game. Uh, was this something that you did for yourself or what? did you see people requesting these types of hacks for these games I, in the community? I think what got me started on that was... Uh... Many years ago, Chamas Yench released a, a game called Sadisteroids. It was a hack of Asteroids. And, and uh, yeah. yeah, it was a ridiculously hard version of Asteroids. <laughs> <laughs> um, part of the appeal for that for me is, uh, especially, uh, all my kids are adults now, but uh, over the past 20, 20 years or so, raising my kids, um, my gameplay time has been fairly limited. So having a game that's super hard that only takes 30 seconds to a minute to play, and I could do in short spurts. Go, yeah. Just try to get better at the hard version. Um, it fit well with uh, I don't know how much time I had to actually play games, and I, I don't know. I, I I just had fun with that. I made probably four or five different hacks, making them ridiculously hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great reason. <laughs> I don't have time to play. It's got to be short and hard. Go. <laughs> um, so if anybody has questions in the chat, um, just put in all caps question, and then um, then I'll be able to see your question. Um, somebody said you're kicking ass. S Yardley says you're kicking ass. Uh, I don't. Know. <laughs> in the in the last game, I saw you're like up. It was going super speedy. Oh, it, on the it gets screen. fast really quick. So. Um, so you've gone back to games years later and updated them, such as Bombs Away evolving into Bomb Barrage and Asteroid Escape evolving into <coughs> Warship. How do you determine when a game is done? Or does it fall under that old saying of art is never done, only abandoned? That's an excellent question, James. I, it never feels it never <laughs> like anything's done. <laughs> um, th yeah. those, those yeah, games really weren't though <clears throat> um, I, 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 okay. I never really got those to where I wanted them to be but as far as uh, when I call something done I guess it's just when I feel like it is I mean 
th those uh, now feel complete to me. I mean, I, I added some extra things. I wanted the splash screens at the beginning, you know, with my name and the Atari Age jingle or the logo and uh, a better right. menus for selecting options at the beginning of the game. Really, I just wanted to put some, some of the knowledge I've gained in the last, say, 10 years or so into some of my older games and just make them better. And then... Uh, yeah. And, and maybe with, like, the knowledge uh, that you've gained since then, um, <clears throat> be able to put the things in that you w wanted to in the beginning, but maybe didn't didn't know how or you know a, a better way to do it yeah. now. So let's move into the next game, which is Cave-In. Um, is this the first original game that was for sale in the Atari hmm, Age store. It's my first original that was that for sale, did. yes. Yes. So I know that it's a goal of mine to eventually get an original game uh, published through an Atari Age. I've had games adjacent to mine put on like the um, 2600, um, no, the Atari VCS hmm. that have like our characters in it, but I didn't make the game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's definitely a goal of mine, and I'm sure a lot of other people's to get a, a game published by Atari Age, which is technically Atari now, under the banner of Atari, so it almost feels super, super official. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about what that experience was like in the mid-2000s when Cave-In was published by Atari Age. Yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head with uh, just, at the time, just feeling like if I got something published in the Atari Age store, I, it would just make me so proud. It would just, uh, it's kind of just cool. So uh, I, de I developed yeah. a relationship with uh, with Al, I mean, by, by that point, you know, 2007, 2008, I guess, when I was starting to work on Cave-In. And, uh, and the, he was very receptive to the idea. I probably am the one that brought it up. Um, I worked on this game for several years. I mean, not solidly, off and on, but uh, I, this yeah. wasn't finished, I'd say 2007 and 2009, maybe. I worked on it for probably two years. <clears throat> and, yeah. Uh, and again, it was too, also because of the reception that it got. I mean, I, Al pays attention on the forums. I mean, if he, if he sees something he does. that uh, <laughs> is garnering a lot of attention, <laughs> positive comments, uh, he's going to know that, hey, this is something people want to buy or want to uh, play. So, yeah, and he steps in and says, "Oh, you maybe you can change this or this to polish it <laughs> up." And he really helps with the manuals, and you know, reaches out to people for artwork if people need artwork done for them. It's, it pe I mean, we've talked to Al over the years, and I think people get a, a appreciate a sense of how much, how much hands on he is with developers, and it's it's absolutely amazing that he's only one person I, know, really I, I, may, I make the joke that he's done clones of himself but he must have somehow <laughs> to be able to do what everything he does oh, and you, you mentioned artwork and uh david exton did the artwork yeah. for cave in and uh he's oh, a he's amazing and, uh, he's actually doing the artwork for drone patrol right now as well oh excellent i can't wait to yeah. see that he's oh he's so good he really and his artwork is really really unique and foreboding and dark and i i think it works well with a lot of the games that he's paired up with and matched up with so i'm really looking forward to seeing uh what he's going to do with drone patrol have you got previews of it yet i do but i have to ask him if he it would let me share those <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. you don't have to now you don't have to now I, I'm sure we'll talk with you again before uh, PRGE to talk about all the new releases that are mm -hmm. coming up. So that that one is scheduled for this PRGE? It is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if all goes okay. well. That's <laughs> excellent. Oh, that's excellent. So talk a little bit about Cave-In, um, your motivation, or, you know, why, why did you want to make a game that uh, is kind of a dungeon crawler, explorer... Uh, flip screen kind of maze well, game? it was inspired by adventure. I mean, I, I wanted to make a multi-room game. Um, I didn't really have the experience or knowledge to make it happen, so it was really um, Michael Rideout, um, CGT Gruff on the Atari Age forums. Um, he's yeah. the guy that I mean, he won one of the Sword Quest uh, contests way back then, I think. But the, wow. <laughs> the point is, he, he made a demo on Atari Basic that... Uh, 
that demonstrated how to programmatically move between rooms to be able to switch screens like that. And uh, he made a really right. simple demo that was the basis of Kaven, basically. Uh, oh, okay. Once I determined uh, that particular aspect that was challenging to me, it just opened up. Like then I, I just worked on it for months and created custom maps and then started adding more enemies and stuff to avoid. And it just became a, a labor of love. I had so much fun making this game. And uh, it's one of those ones, too, that I probably would do differently if I did it now. But uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to go back and yeah. change it now because it's a, it's already published on cartridge. So it would be a sequel scenario if I ever revisited this, this game. Yeah. Because you kind of want... Oops. Did you turn on music? Yeah, I accidentally touched my microphone. <laughs> they can't hear it, I don't think. So. <laughs> Stop playing. Here we go. That's funny. <laughs> Um, I have a question from the chat. Um, Zaptari asks, Steve, what's your favorite game from other homebrews on Atari Age? <clears throat> oh, that's a tough one. Because I see you have a ton in behind <clears throat> yeah, you, I so yeah. definitely one of those uh, you like. <laughs> um, currently, um, I've been playing um, Attack of the Petsky Robots and um, Raptor. I really like Raptor. That, that actually uh, was part of the inspiration so for Drone Patrol. You can probably see that a little bit. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. Raptor's such a great arcadey, slick, beautiful looking game. It's yeah. Andrew Pauly did such a great uh, job on that game, as as with all of his. Games. Um, I've also really enjoyed, as of late, the, some of the remakes. The uh, Arty that I bought at PRG last year and uh, Keystone Coppers. Yeah, had a lot of fun with those. But uh, nailing yeah, down those are both excellent nailing games. down one would be impossible. I have so many. I, I own probably eighty Homer homebrews. So. Oh, yeah. It, I mean, they're all good. I mean, they passed the Al Yeruso test, so <laughs> they're all good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and, it, and it's really hard to play favorites. And I mean, I do favorite episodes, but I mean, they're continuous favorite episodes and I don't rank them. I just go, these are some of my favorite, you know, platformers or shooters. And I really have to categorize <laughs> them because it is hard to pit them up against each other. They really shouldn't be. They all stand on their own, and they're amazing. It's your favorite kind of level. Oh, yeah, Dark Mazes. I love it. It's, it's my favorite. At least there's no enemies in the Dark Mazes. At least, yeah. Not yet. Not <laughs> um, yet. Let's see. In, in your notes, you said cave-in. Um, oh, I think I already touched on this a little bit. In your notes, it says cave-in was inspired by Michael Rideout's Move Around Rooms demo. Uh, which in turn lets you created, uh, create a code snippets thread with over 50,000 downloads of sample code. And <clears throat> we are talking a little bit before, but this really speaks to the process of being part of the community of not only learning code from other people um, that have come before, <clears throat> but inspiring those who are starting maybe on their first game tomorrow. So can you talk a little bit about that the give and take process that you've experienced yourself, you know, even making that program for creating adventure hacks or, you know, these code snippets that you've posted that have been downloaded tens of thousands of times that have must have landed in so many other games that are out today. I guess I'm, I'm so passionate about programming and I have so much fun with it. I want everybody else to have fun too. Um, if anybody's struggling yeah. with it, um, I want to do as much as I can to help when I, whenever asked, I've fielded so many questions via private message and, uh, I, I help everybody if they ask me, at least I try to, but yeah, I mean that, that whole feeling of giving back, uh, that's just part of it. I mean, so, so many people have helped me. I feel it's my obligation to do the same for everybody else. It's just being a part of the community, like you mentioned. So, yeah. And, and I know when I was making my pack line game, the only game I've made so far, <laughs> but there will be more. Um, and it's and it's a port. I want to make original ones, but I I reference things here, there, everywhere. Ask I, I didn't ask any questions because I didn't I didn't need to yet. But uh, because there is such a wealth of um, people who have come before me asking the same question, um, so it's just an endless uh, list of information on the Atari Age forums and around. All over the internet, people have made uh, video tutorials as well, or tutorial series, and we'll get to one that you did as well a little bit later in the show. 
Um, it's it's something that allows you and myself and, and many other people to make the games that we make, and it's and it's why I do the show too. It's because. I want to honor as best as I can to the best of my ability this amazing community that we're a part of. Yeah, I've never found another uh, vintage gaming community like Atari Age. There doesn't seem to exist. So it's an amazing place. No. Yeah, and and kudos to everybody who keeps it in line. Uh, mostly I. <laughs> he's, he's seemingly be able to have a thousand eyes on a thousand threads all at once. Uh, and keeping it uh, held together it's it's amazing so we're gonna move on to gate racer <laughs> are you having fun i am <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. i was just making some headway <laughs> uh, a 2600 uh game uh 2013 and 2024 uh, so tell us a little bit about the inspiration for this game we're going to be playing the newest up-to-date chock full version of okay. the game here yeah this this started out that's a, it's basically a, a 2K challenge for myself. And uh, <laughs> I spent a great deal of time on the 2K version of this game because I had to uh, modify the assembly files of Atari Basic in order to squeeze it, everything in that I needed to do. <laughs> so wow. I kind of I have a custom version of Atari Basic that I need to compile the 2K version of this game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Very custom, yeah. Um, but... Uh, Again, making that game so small, I, I left out so much that I wanted to do. So uh, I almost immediately made a 4K version right after that simply added a menu with options, what I thought was a really ugly menu, <laughs> using playfield blocks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's really nice and concise, and it shows not only like easy, medium, hard, but what those mean yeah. right on the screen, and that's very unique. It's very few games that I've seen that usually. You select those options, and that makes up the game. But, or the game just says easy, medium, and you're like, uh, "What? What does easy mean?" So this is this is really nice to have yeah, that thanks. menu there. And, uh, yeah, the the menu is similar to what it did in the 4K version. It just looks nice, but it doesn't provide nearly the same <laughs> yeah. amount of information like you were saying. And uh, I, that was just kind of an epiphany. I was using Kirk Israel's. Uh, tools. He has a lot of online tools for music and uh, graphics creation. And uh, yeah. when I started working with that, like, wow, I could I could use this to make um, not only a title screen, but menu screens, instruction screens, and um, it takes up a lot of space. So, I mean, these, these games are relatively simple, although they use 32K. Most of it is the extra stuff that isn't actually part of the game. But uh, <laughs> but it doesn't it doesn't seem to really it doesn't really matter to me. I just want it to be cool. So yeah, yep. That's that is the end goal <laughs> for any game is like whatever means necessary to get it to play and be fun. It doesn't matter if it's 2K or if it has uh, an extra arm chip <laughs> in it. Whatever means it takes to get to the fun. Yep. Um, so. With your game Gate Racer, like you said, it uh, it went through many versions, 2K to 4K um, in 2013, and now a 32K game uh, recently updated. I know that a lot of other developers challenge themselves creating a game in a small footprint, like 2 or 4K. Is that something that you actively think about, or do you just, like we said, create the game and it just fills up the space? It's like, oh, I need better graphics. Well, it's going to be bigger. Or have you ever made a game, it's like, I'm going to make a 4K game and get as much fun into it as I can. So for me, the, the 2K version of Gate Racer, that's the only time I've ever done that. Put that um, ROM size yeah. limitation on myself. Um, since then, really, I, I just kind of create the vision in my head as I go. And however big it turns out to be is how big it turns out to be. So um, okay. like with the my largest 2600 game was um, Cave Raider. It turned out to be 64K because I needed that much space in order to do everything I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the, the the size is is very arbitrary, and I mean you've made a 512 512K 7800 <clears throat> game now, which is really big. Yeah. Like probably the biggest size that most people have have made on a 7800 now. Um. So. What tools do you use to program um, your 2600 games right now? Uh, you, you mentioned Batari Basic. Have you have you done 
assembly games, or have you just stuck to a, t a Batari Basic? I don't have any games that are 100% assembly. Um, a lot of my Batari games, Batari Basic games, also have inline assembly in them. Um, like the uh, what you've seen in this one, the, those menus are assembly, the Atari Age logo is assembly. The, mostly it's the intro stuff, but when you get into the core gameplay, that's really Atari Basic code. So. Right, right. And and you just use the Atari Basic editor and. and oh, and as far as. Yeah, go. I mean, right now, I, as yeah. far as assembly environment, I, I use Microsoft Visual Basic uh, code, the code editor. Okay. And uh, okay. there's some extra tools you can download for that 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 give you a. And you can use it. There's a sprite editor and uh, some other things that you can put in there to help a little bit. But early on, I just use Windows Notepad. I mean, the first ten years or so, all those games, <laughs> way back when, I just used a simple text yeah. editor. <laughs> I, I noticed the extensions were TXT a yeah. lot of uh, the early stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just. I really, it's just text. Yeah. Uh, and it just gets compiled. So whatever, whatever it takes to get to there. Um, well, let's see. I think we'll move on to the next one. And uh, we're moving into the 7800 era. So let's start off in on what you use to make 7800 games. What tools do you use? <coughs> well, the, uh, the big difference really with the uh, 7800 games versus creating a game with the 2600 is the graphics. So I can create 7800 basic code with a uh, Windows Notepad also. But uh, as far as graphics, that, it got a little more challenging in the beginning. I pretty much got it nailed down now, but you have to use uh, indexed PNG files. So there are okay. the only real free tool that's, that's really good for doing that is GIMP. So uh, I was not really a heavy user yeah. of that application before 2014 or so. I'm pretty good at it now. But that is absolutely the easiest yeah. way to create graphics for 7800 now. So, <clears throat> mm. so really, I'd, if uh, for creating 7800 games, it's just any text editor. I use VS Code, um, GIMP. Okay. And then uh, for certain yeah. games like the one you just pulled up, um, I use the Tiled application too to make backgrounds. It's okay. basically a map editor and that allows you to place tiles on the screen for uh, creating background images. It makes it a little bit easier. And um, let's talk a little bit about the teams that you may work with, or the people that you may work with, like uh, David Exton, like you were saying, for, the, for some of the uh, graphics for your physical releases do you generally do games on your own or do you collaborate sometimes with other people for music sound graphics things like that um there have been some collaborations I'll, honestly a lot of my games have been solo efforts um the biggest collaborative effort of any of my games was dungeon soccer um i i mean that that was i'd say 50 50 but mike may have done more than i did <laughs> I'm not, we didn't really keep score. <laughs> but, um, as, as of late, the uh, music. Um, so the, the newer games I've, I've, re I've released, well, one that you're going to be showcasing later that's yet unnamed, <laughs> um, features some features some uh, music, and uh, that okay. was somebody I just I ran into him randomly. I was I was doing some some audio and sound conversions myself, just trying to learn it, and uh, I realized how incredibly difficult it was. So I reached out to somebody on the Mod Archive forums and uh, just randomly because he had some music I liked and he got back to me and just started collaborating with me and creating music for me to include in, in, uh, in my games. So he, he wrote his name. I don't actually know his real name. He's never shared his real name with me. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a few of those people and around. He's a yeah. Hexaflight on the Atari Age forums. So he created music for oh. Drone Patrol and for the newer game. Yep. That that's why I know his name from from Jerome Patrol. Yeah. yeah, very nice. Um, so this game was first on the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. You made a version of this, and uh, you remade it for the Seventy Eight Hundred. Did you start from scratch, or did you use any of the code from the Twenty Six Hundred carrying over to the Seventy? No, it was from scratch. The uh, the Twenty Six Hundred version actually wasn't really completed because right in the middle of that is when uh, Random Terrain on the Atari H forum said, hey, have you seen 7800 Basic? Well, no, I haven't. 
I, I went over and discovered that. It's like, okay, I'm, this is what I'm moving to now. <laughs> I was just, I was just amazed at what what you could do, what the differences were. I can have 24 flicker free spites on the screen at once. What? <laughs> Rather than, Rather two? than two? Oh my goodness! So, uh, <laughs> this is quite an so, upgrade. <laughs> uh, I made a, a touchdown challenge demo, basically, in uh, 2014, I think, and uh, I re revisited this game in 2022. And when I revisited in 22, I, 2022, I started over again. It was the the third rewrite was also okay. from scratch. And how was the transition from programming 2600 games to 7800 games? Was there a lot of carryover? Obviously, the basics of logic and um, data storage is still there but did did uh, programming on the 2600 really help the 7800 um, programming oh absolutely i mean if, if you're really really comfortable with Atari basic and good at it i would think that it would be pretty easy to move to 7800 basic um the, the big the okay. biggest challenge really is the creating graphics i mean that that's dramatically different right. and somewhat difficult if you're not used to it <laughs> Yeah, uh, the way I mean, the way twenty six hundred draws graphics is is quite unique in itself. Drawing yeah. line by line, rather than sprite based graphics and just absolute positioning, which is on the twenty six hundred very powerful, but also very limiting at the same time. It's a it's a real give and take, yeah. which is why I love the twenty six hundred. It's a, it's a fun yeah, machine. I still like working on both. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was one of my questions. We might as well skip to that one. Um, so you still, it, some people make a transition from 2600 to 7800 and don't really look back, um, but a few keep programming on both, and that's something you've done. Even this year, you've uh, released games on 7800 and 2600. Um, is is that because you love both platforms, or is there something that one offers that the other doesn't offer? And, and vice versa. Well, they, they both offer a unique set of challenges. Um, it's I can make a 2600 game a lot faster than I can make a 7800 game. Um, again, mostly <laughs> right. because of the graphics. But uh, sometimes if I get a, an idea in my head of something I want to work on, I just it just kind of becomes obvious which platforms are more of a natural fit for it. If it's something really simple that might be well served on the 2600, and that and it's I can uh, develop faster on that platform. Then uh, I might go that direction, but uh, I don't know something like Drone Patrol. I can't imagine making a version for the twenty six hundred. I don't think it would work. <laughs> yeah, there are there are certain types of games or styles of games that it's just like no, nah, this is this just too complicated. There's too many things on the screen, or you need a background, or you know some sort of play field that's really really complicated yeah. that just wouldn't serve well on the 7800 or you know some games just work better on the 2600 as well um so the next game we're going to be playing it well i'm not going to be playing tanya's going to be playing is dungeon stalker 7800 game uh made in 2015 and as soon as people see it uh, there's also voice for this so there's going to be some uh, hi, hi, some hi. audio coming up hi atari so, wants to play oh atari wants to play <laughs> He's, He's right at the joystick. You, are you going to hit the buttons for me? <laughs> yes? So this okay. is um, inspired by the Intellivision game Night Stalker, which people will see. Beautiful title screen with the flashing lights. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, go for it. So I'm novice. Probably novice. I have played this game or a version I'm sure you played something similar. Yes. You may not have played this specific okay. game. Go to start game. So uh, I when I when I started I making this game, Hi, I, are you looking? I, are you looking? I, I, um, so this tell us a little bit about this game. That uh, what what obviously the original game inspired you to do it. Um, tell us a little bit more. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed Dark Cavern and and Night Stalker. Oh, oh. Um, wait a second. <sighs> And uh, really, I, oh, I started yeah. off working. They can hear you, but we can't. Yeah, sorry. Cat. Okay. <laughs> Are we good? Are you blaming the cat? Uh, fully blaming the cat. Uh oh. <laughs> One second. What did you do? What did you do? I'll try to play some Dungeon Stalker while Terry licks my hand. Here. Oh, I see. <laughs> I see. He's frozen. 
That could be the problem. It does that. That's on the list of things to uh, to fix. Is that really necessary. Uh, no, I want it. To... There we go. Now we can hear you again. Woo! <laughs> Sorry uh, no about problem. that. Um, so uh, Dungeon Soccer just started off with me wanting to make a maze game, and uh, the the first one that came to mind when I started making the graphics was my soccer. So. I made it, and I made a guy that could move around the maze, and I thought, well, what am I going to do with this next? And uh, I reached out to Mike Sarna to ask him if he could help me um, help with the code to make monsters move around the screen. And, uh, and okay. it kind of snowballed from there, because uh, I think I really piqued his interest, because he just thought it was a cool idea, too. And uh, the Atari Age user Trevor was also instrumental in this game, too. He... Uh, did hours and hours of playtesting and made tons and tons of comments and suggestions. Um, I, I think I have about 30 pages of private messages with, uh, <laughs> with, with wow. Trevor and Mike uh, related to this game. So a lot of the development process on this, I guess, was more in a vacuum than normal. It wasn't in the public thread, and it was really uh, it was right. really me and Mike and Trevor that uh, that worked on it. But uh, attention to detail in this game, I mean, we, we put so much effort in making every little thing in this game um, is there for a reason. Uh, we, we went back and forth yeah. about the placement of single pixels. <laughs> wow. Well, the, the monster animation is really good. Um, I think there's three, two or three frames for each of them. Um, yeah, really excellent graphics. And it's quite a beloved game for the Intellivision, so it's it's great to be able to have it on the 7800. It was uh, um, Mike's idea to add the wizard that, that's on the screen. Um, that was kind of an Amish <laughs> wizard war. And, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah. And it's a great, great look. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Um, so did you have an Intellivision growing up? I don't know if we touched on this. You I didn't. did not have um, one when I was a kid. We, I bought one probably in the late 80s when I was in my late teens. That's when they were, you know, discounted. I thought I got it for really, really cheap. I think it's Sears. I had the Sears version of it. Right. And you had this game for it yeah, as yeah. well? And um, so the games the games you, you create... Um, would you say a lot of them have been inspired from games you played growing up, or is it more of a factor of games you've always wanted to see on the 2600 and 7800? Um, so more like, what is what is your general inspiration for for the overview of the games that you have created for these um, two systems? A lot of it probably is more on the inspiration side rather than thinking about. Well, I really wish this would this particular thing would be on this platform. So I'll, I'll go back to games that I really enjoyed playing when I was younger. And uh, and honestly, usually when I start a project, I, I don't really know where it's going to end up. It's uh, I, I, I start with an idea and uh, then I start just trying different things just to see if they'll work. And uh, a lot of aspects to um, the drone control are like that too. It's just a... Try to put it in the game. Oh, nope, that uses too much CPU. That won't work. <laughs> it was just, yeah, trying out ideas as I go. I, I don't, like, create a storyboard or have a, a an outline of exactly what I want to do before I start. But I, I kind of enjoy doing it that way. And where did the seeds of the idea come from? Is it a mechanic? Is it graphics? Um, where where do they, Where does the game really start from? The original, original seed. Um, it's probably a little bit of both. What you just said, as far as mechanics or graphics, it would depend on the game. But at the other, I, I can't say that I'm a, probably a, a good enough programmer to say that I would go with mechanics because I, a, a lot okay. of what I what I'll see, like like the, the gate racer code that involves a little bit of physics moving back and forth, that was definitely gathered from looking at samples from other people. So. Right. Yeah, because that is a very unique way of moving. It's got the momentum, and you have to almost like steer your car, like your like you're skiing or something like that. It's it's a very different type of movement. I was kind of thinking um, like that. Which, which ice driving on Indy Five Hundred. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ice driving. <laughs> yeah. Which which makes it stand out, and which is what you want to bring when you make a game. You don't want to just be like, oh, the ten thousandth version of this. 
you want something to stand out to people to go oh this is something different that's great this is this is awesome thank you what was that noise actually i don't know i think it was the earbud is oh, okay. it okay yeah it's fine okay good <laughs> just, just <laughs> somebody did something um okay we're gonna move on to death merchant yeah. next And uh, for those of you who uh, have not seen the cover for this, it is absolutely <coughs> gorgeous. Is this a David yep, Exton? That is another cover? David Exton work. You can you can really tell <laughs> <laughs> that he does this. It's almost like um, a painting. Like he does it. I, I swear, I've asked one time whether he does actual painting or I think it's digital painting. I believe he paints it um, on his iPad. Yeah, and it's very. He always has this foreboding desolate look. <laughs> <laughs> very dark and uh, it's like oh my god all hope is lost but it really suits this game and all the other games that he's made uh uh covers for so uh, i would be so honored if i ever had the joy to have david x <laughs> make a cover for me he's just magnificent he really is yeah so this is a really unique game for either one of these systems. Obviously, this would be almost impossible on the 2600, so it's well suited for the 7800 because it has a lot of text. And so it's a unique and standout title for most for a mostly text-based strategy trading game. Um, so since you since this, you've made an Atari 7800 book cart called Time Machine by H.G. Wells, um, which maybe followed from this because this has a lot of text i'm just guessing here but were there any surprises or challenges coding something um with a lot more text than visuals uh for a game like this <clears throat> actually the the challenge with this game wasn't the text i mean uh, plotting the text on the screen uh, 7800 basic makes that pretty simple um what really made my head spin with this game was just the sheer amount of math calculations in every move that you make in this game. <laughs> oh yeah, because everything affects everything, and this this harkens back uh, to BBS games with multiplayer, and you'd log in and you you trade with other people, and you'd go on adventures and things like that. Yeah, and, and I think you you did send in my in in the notes you sent to me about games like that, which were probably an inspiration. And yeah, yeah. going back to uh, all my college days, late 80s, early 90s, um, the BBS is I actually ran a, a, a BBS when I was uh, in college too. But there were games, there were- Nice, so did I. Yeah, <laughs> tell us this up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. yeah, there were a lot of BBS <laughs> games that were similar to this. Um, there was also a DOS game yes. called Dope Wars that I, I played on my IBM PC back then. Yeah. And um, I actually created a version of, of Death Merchant um, for using uh, Visual Basic 6 in the late 90s. I think I, I shared it on a GeoCities website back then. You know, I imagine two or three people probably <laughs> downloaded it. <laughs> nice. So this is a, a, the second time I've actually made this, this particular game. Um, it, yeah, I wasn't sure that it was really a perfect fit compared to the rest of the 7800 library being a you know a text-based strategy <laughs> game, but um, it was actually a, I Al mean, asked me I, I believe about putting this in the store. This is one of those times where I I didn't didn't wow. necessarily think it was going to be a, a good fit for the store, and he did. So, but, uh, but oh, I, wow. was, I mean I, I enjoyed playing it. It's it's fun, <laughs> but I I like the genre so. Yeah, and I mean, it does fill a gap in the 7800 game library that just does not exist. Mm -hmm. So I think that might have been one of his inspirations for <laughs> putting it in the store, as as well as it being a, a very good example of one of those types of games and probably hits the nostalgia button for him as it does for a lot of us who ran BBSs, who played, you know, Trade Wars and uh, all those types of text-based games on the BBSs. So I think, and yeah, and it's really, really well done. Now I want to hit on doing testing for your games. And I know you do a lot of public postings of your games. You're very open with the binaries of your games and the communities, uh, even games destined to be put on cartridge in the Atari age store. Now, uh, is this a, 
conscious thing do you think about posting games? It is just something that you've already, always done. Uh, be very open uh, with the games, even games that you're going to sell. Um, yeah, I've kind of always been that way. Honestly, I just I'm doing this for fun. I mean, nobody, no yeah. homebrewers are doing this for money. I'll, I can tell you that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if I put it out the full binary out there for free, then more people can play it. And uh, I, I want I want exactly. more people to be able to play the games. So I'm probably going to continue yeah. to always post binaries on the forums of any game, even if I'm selling it. And and it's kind of cool because you can see the number of downloads too. Mm -hmm. um, you don't get that kind of instant feedback. And also talking about feedback people play them and give their opinions 10 minutes later an hour later a day later and you can see the feedback and getting into the taste testing and beta testing do you kind of use the forums as a test grounds or do you send out early versions of the games before the first posted version to people that you test like Steve Ramirez, for example, he seems to play every, <laughs> test every single game out there. Yeah, Steve's been great. Um, yeah, I like. <laughs> yeah, I like it when he shares uh, shares his findings on the public forums. I, uh, I there's a core group of people that I, I'll make requests to sometimes, um, but for the most part, I do a lot of the testing myself, and uh, then I'll yeah. I'll put it out publicly, and then just kind of hope people play it and, and uh, provide feedback. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, yeah. and that that's. Um, one of the strengths of the community too it's it's such a large community that you can get feedback um, good or bad uh, on your games and how how do you take feedback uh, for example do you get some negative feedback uh, in terms of like oh change everything about your game <laughs> because I don't like it uh, usually d that doesn't happen but um, so maybe talk about feedback for a little bit and the types of feedback you get from the community and how it shapes the way you make games. I think for the most part, Atari Age is a pretty positive forum in general. I th you're you're going to tend to get more positive feedback than negative feedback, I think. Um, there have been some yeah. things that have been negative, but I wouldn't say they're attacks. It would just be, hey, I think you're doing this all wrong. But I've, I've never <laughs> felt personally attacked by anybody that's posted on the forums. Um, and thing, things no. that have been negative, um, I just take it with a grain of salt and I'll respond, respond nicely. Like, no, I'm not going to do that, but thank you for your feedback. <laughs> so I just, yeah, just exactly. Nice. Because sometimes, sometimes you don't want to take your game in that direction. Mm -hmm. And it's, and, and luckily or unluckily, these games only sell a certain amount. We're a very niche community. So a lot of developers make games for their self primarily. Is this a game I would want to see and I would want to play? And I think there's a lot of fallout from that that other people wants, want to play this type of game as well. Because we've all grown up with the same type of games, going through the same eras of games. Um, so do you primarily make these games for yourself um, to enjoy? I mean, you've said you enjoy just making the game never mind playing it but that's a follow from from making the game you have to test it yourself thousands of times by the end you know you're an expert at your own game but do you make them for your, for yourself primarily um, they're all based on what i would want to play for sure um, i mean i love getting the feedback and i've certainly made a lot of changes based on comments people have made in the past um, but yeah, I'm yeah. kind of making it for me, and uh, it's funny you say that because yeah, by the time I'm done testing it and the game's finally done, I don't really want to play it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true, and I mean, uh, making films in my past. By the time you're finished editing the film, you have to go to film festivals and see it a dozen, <laughs> two dozen more times. You're know, like, oh, this film. But it actually, uh, you may be able to relate to this once the the piece of art you know the film or the game is out you kind of see it through fresh eyes when somebody else is playing yeah. it say either we play it live on the show or you watch somebody review the game it kind of brings that that initial joy back to it and you and you go oh yeah i, I can see why people why i started this game why i got excited about making this game uh, do you did you get that sense when other people play your games oh, yeah. Yeah, I've experienced that a lot, just watching your show when you feature some of my games in the past. 
um, seeing your comments yeah. and then the comments that people post in chat. Uh, it's exciting to see people enjoy what you've done. <laughs> and uh, and I, when people make comments, it's been fun incorporating some ideas that I may not necessarily have thought of if they hadn't been brought up by a new player. So, yeah, yeah your show has been great for that, too. Um, getting the feedback from watching you play and the responses people get watching you play. Oh, thank you. And and that is one of the reasons that I do the show live, that we do the show live, <laughs> is that a, a huge majority of the people in the chat are developers, and usually the developers show up for the gameplay, and because they're able to see it and give feedback and talk about things, we're able to ask questions in real time, so it's like a live playtesting, <clears throat> almost. And um, the other reason that it's much easier to do things live <laughs> because you just press record and you don't have to edit anything. I've done enough editing in my life. And, and I love the instant feedback. I've always done live shows for, you know, 25 years on the Internet. And it's just fun. I mean, this, yeah, this is fun, right? People get to ask questions directly to you. And, and if anybody does have any questions, um, Definitely put it in the chat with big, in all capital letters, question. And I'm not looking at the um, chat while we're, while we're talking. It's on a screen over here, and <laughs> I can't really look. Yeah, I've got I've got it off to the side. Nobody, yeah. People are making comments, yeah. obviously. Like, uh, I can't remember I can't remember when this was put in. Is this game available? Um, Chili Nip says that. Um, all his games are either available in the Atari Age Store, or they're available to download. Um, so, yes. <laughs> the easiest, yes, they are the easiest place to find my games is it's, I just put a really quick and dirty website up at maximusgames.us. Um, it's it's a WordPress type site, so it's really just a list of links, and they all will point you back to the Atari Age threads where you can download pretty much everything I've ever made. So. Yeah, and we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, your website in a second. Yeah. Uh, the next game we're going to jump to is legend of silver peak from 2018 uh onward so again uh another game title that fills a vastly underrepresented <laughs> genre which is rpgs for the 7800 there are some um but um i don't think there's too many games of the genre due to the overwhelming amount of content you have to put into an rpg <laughs> uh, it's a lot of work and anytime and they take years and years and years uh to develop if you look at like development time for like say carl g's penult it's just it's massive and the and the testing that you have to put into these games is is massive as well so you started working on this in 2018 and you've stated about it's about 75 percent done at this point so you can can you talk a little bit about everything that's gone into legend of silver peak to bring it to where it is now and and what it needs to um, be added to it to get it across the finish line it was a tremendous amount of work i had I, almost a bit overwhelming because that that i immediately started knowing this was going to probably be a 512k game and uh yeah <clears throat> i had a lot of fun putting the graphics together when it first started i mean it basically was started off this started off as uh, from the this legend of zelda map demo that i put out um, probably just a couple of years before this. So I already had a, basically a game engine capable of right. uh, having 255 unique screens that you could walk around. So this is a massive map. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I, uh, I put a lot of time and effort into really just the, the graphics um, and the, uh, yeah. <clears throat> the storyline probably needs a little bit of work. Uh, the main things that aren't done on it <laughs> is it, it has no sound whatsoever. It's something that I'm really not very good at anyway. That's why I was so gracious to right. have that guy Hexa Flight help with the uh, newer games. But uh, some yeah. of the game mechanics aren't finished. Uh, you can enter a marketplace to buy items that don't do anything. Um, you, you'll see on the status <laughs> bar that you have magic points, although there's no magic that you can cast. Um, okay. There are some little bugs here and there. Um, there's certain, certain screens you might be able to move someplace you're not supposed to. Um, some of the right. attack sequences might not go like you would expect. Um, I would say in order to, to complete this game, to get it to 100% completion would probably require another three or four hundred dollars a week. So whether or not I get back to this, I'm not <laughs> sure there's a reason it's been sitting dormant for so long. <laughs> 
Um, I'll, I'll have yeah, to truly be inspired it, to get back to this one, I think. <laughs> it's it's overwhelming and intimidating, I, I bet. You just probably just look at the scope <clears throat> of the whole thing and go, you just don't even start, like you said. You just It's hard to get back into it once you put it down. Once you create a game this big and, and let it sit for so long, I mean, again, that's a massive amount of code already. Just remembering what yeah. I did and why I did it, and uh, kind of getting back in that the flow too. of uh, remembering what I did. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what is this subroutine? What do I <laughs> yeah. do here? What What is this variable for? Oh my god! <laughs> um, so, looking through developers' games, you can usually find a thread that connects them all together. Um, but you've made such a huge variety of games, I can't seem to find a, a commonality for any of them. Um, so what is, is there a commonality between these games or is there something that connects them all together or do you just go i want to make this game or or is the commonality something new every game you want to try something different something challenging for yourself uh, i think the latter um usually when i get inspired to make a, a game it is something that is i something i've not done before um that that is part of the fun of the challenge too maybe try to do something just different. Um, revisiting the same thing over and over again would really be all that fun for me. Um, the only <laughs> the only games that have a similar, somewhat common theme are the uh, Cave In and Cave Raider games. I use the same character sprite, and they're both kind of cave themed. Right. Although that character is unnamed. <laughs> <laughs> unnamed cave explorer. Yeah. So uh, unofficial sequel. Unofficial sequel, sure. So. Yeah, and I mean, it's always fun to learn. It's always fun to push yourself. And I think that's a big motivating factor for a lot of developers as well, is to, you know, get better at better, better and better at programming. And it's not necessarily better and better games. Uh, different games are motivating. Um, to learn new things, to learn new graphic techniques, to be more... Uh, efficient in your code, whatever motivates you, or for like Thomas Yench, can I fit this in 4K? Yeah. <laughs> right? That's his motivating factor. What is the best game I can fit into 4K? And he continually astounds I, I, everybody, in, including me. I always pour over sample code. When everybody, whenever anyone posts something about, hey, I have this idea, and posts just a snippet of something that they could do, I just pour over that and try to see if I, there's something I can do with that, if it's something different. So <clears throat> that is kind yeah. of where I know we haven't gotten to that game yet, but that's kind of where Drone Patrol started. We started with a demo that MK, MK Smith posted with parallax scrolling. I'm like, what can I do with right. this? And uh, it turned into Drone Patrol. And I was, and I was remember an interview I did with John Champeau about uh, Zookeeper or related to Zookeeper and how the bricks came hmm. about. And it was just a special f flicker of two different types of graphics. And it just looked like a brick. And he's like, there's bricks in Zookeeper. Yeah. Let's make Zookeeper, right? And it's just that spark. Like you said, you see this this thing in a game and you go, oh, there's, I can use that in something else. And, yeah. you know, a whole, whole game spark from just some uh, simple idea. It can idea. really be that quick, too. Just, yeah, like a light bulb goes off. I can use that for that. And then it just takes off. Yep. Um, so we're playing jacks or better now. Um so another jacks are, be are better is another departure in terms of genres. Here's a card game, all of a sudden. Um, so what what was the motivating factor? It, do you play cards? Do you uh, watch card playing on television with those competitive superstar players? You know, um, I, I go to a casino once every four or five years and play a couple games of jacks or better. <laughs> no, I, I'm not yeah. much of a card. So player. you're a hardcore gambler then? Okay, I see. <laughs> no, really, this was just because I'd never done it before. Like I've never made a card game. Um, I've seen other people attempt it in the past. Uh, when I when I yep. made this, just probably a month or less prior, somebody had I can't remember his name now. Somebody had posted a demo or a sample game called High Card on the 7800 basic forums. And uh, looking at that, like, huh, I wonder if maybe I could make a, a poker game, something. I mean, it just kind of inspired me to maybe just try it. So I think yeah. maybe it was sex. And the sure. graphics look great. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really great uh, <clears throat> display for the cards. It's very simple, very visual, huge cards. I, I um, learned a lot about the rules of poker. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. And I remember us playing this on oh, the show, it was and, and it was like, oh, what's going on? I, I, uh, yeah, we had to I learn. I have relearn. played poker before, but it had been such a long time that it was like I apparently forgotten everything about <laughs> what's higher than what. And yeah, that's, it's, it was. Yeah. It was fun though. It was a lot of fun. It's been it's been a while. And it must have been fun, like trying to figure out the lo best, like the logic, the best way to analyze the hand and to match it up with. Uh, giving the the right score um, to the player. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, that type of thing, I I enjoy that too. The, the analytical part of creating uh, games. Hmm. Um, so there's a question from Zaptari. Uh, can an could an older PC game like Rogue work on 7800 hardware? And have you ever tried programming a Jaguar game? <clears throat> so there's two questions. Um, so Rogue, very beloved. I love Rogue, and I would love to see it on I mean, 2600 would be a very big challenge mm. not impossible but 7800 probably be more suited for a game like rogue oh sure i think it would absolutely be possible on the 7800 yeah yeah <clears throat> so i think so as well oh uh, what was part two of that question <laughs> well part okay. part two actually uh melds into another question that i had yeah. so we'll just put them together uh, he asks if you uh, have ever tried programming a Jaguar oh. game, and let me expand out on that. Have you ever thought about or have attempted to program <laughs> on another Atari platform, like uh, Atari 8-bit <clears throat> or Lynx or Jaguar, like uh, um, you suggested? No on the Jaguar, and not because I wouldn't be interested in maybe trying it, but there's a lot of different things there. I would need to own a Jaguar, which I don't. Um, I would. They're expensive, yeah, too. Yeah, <laughs> they are. I would also yeah. need to own a... Uh, a multi card, a flash card of some kind, if I wanted to be able to test. I don't know if one exists for the Jaguar or not. There yeah. does. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's really why is it slipping my mind? Uh yeah, Jag game drive card. And then I don't know anything about it's really what, uh, what uh, how I would do that. Is it is it all assembly language program or are there more basic tools for developing on that platform? I don't know. There are basic tools that you can get. Cyrano J is involved in that. We we play his game sometime in the show. But um, yeah, there's if people are interested or yourself, there are um, you know there's a forum section for Jaguar and there's a programming section as well. So there's the opportunity for anyone who wants to learn Jaguar or if you wanted to expand out into other platforms. Um, have you have you thought about uh, going to like uh, Lynx or uh, or the Atari 400, 800, 8-bit? Um, uh, really, I haven't put that one either, because, again, because I don't own a Lynx. I mean, I, I need yeah. to own the hardware if I'm going to make games for it. I have to be able to test. So. Yeah, there, it's been funny. Some developers that I talk to actually don't own the hardware, and they go off fully off of emulation, which I find insane. It is. But <laughs> somehow they're able to make it work and their games work perfectly because emulators are really really good nowadays they, they and you can pretty much get to a full full game there are there are some some exceptions because i have some especially with systems consoles that are a little bit off that perform a little bit differently and those are the those are the things that you really have to work out once you get close to the finish line. It's like, why is this crashing on this console? On why this 2600 game doesn't work on this 7800 system? I yeah. much respect all the emulator developers out there because I know there's a team of great guys out there that do it, but there's nothing like trying it on oh, real yeah. hardware. I mean, there's always something when I'm making a game that something is different when I uh, plug in a cartridge. Yeah, it's... And that's why I use original hardware. It's just that feeling. It's of, I guess, nostalgia, <clears throat> but also the fact that we're playing new games on just ancient consoles, yeah. <laughs> like like really like forty five year old, forty year old consoles, and they're still working, and they're you're programming using the same rules as you did back then. Mm -hmm. it, you, you're doing nothing different than the people did programming in 1977 on the Atari 2600. You're just using different tricks. But there's just something about the resiliency of that system that has been around for so long and that yeah. people are still developing for it and the games are still fun. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, uh, yeah. I, 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 it's pretty amazing, you know? And I think that's what keeps me going on this is, is to see 
the creativity of people like yourself being able to pull the best out of these systems mm -hmm. and to make games that people never even thought could be made on them or never have been made on them like a poker game there you go. <laughs> for the 70, I could just can't, I, i'm just like woohoo oh i just got a full house <laughs> <laughs> it's so exciting um and is is that the joy is that part of the joy too is what is it about these systems that keep you coming back is it nostalgia is it the challenge is it the reception is it giving get back to the community is it, it's all of these things i'm sure yeah james honestly it's a combination of all of those things um but the primary motivating factor probably is the challenge it's for me it's simply fun and uh yeah. i also as i've just explained you know i've been a, a visual basic programmer since the late 80s so for me, I, while I probably have the mental capacity to learn assembly, I really like BASIC. I really enjoy programming in BASIC. That really hits the nostalgia button for me. I've been doing it for decades. And uh, the fact that those tools exist is part of the reason that I've been doing this. And shout out to the uh, BASIC um, developers that made Batari BASIC, 7800 BASIC. Mm -hmm. They're really powerful. Like most games are made that we play mm -hmm. And that are in the Atari Age store are made with, with these the, basic programs. Mm -hmm. So huge, huge props to those people who made these, oh, yeah. these, these games. Like almost like I'd say ninety nine percent for the seventy eight hundred is in seventy eight hundred basic. There's some people who do assembly. Yeah. I mean, for me, programming is like a logic puzzle. <laughs> yeah. It's so much fun. Just like what's wrong? Why is it doing this? I don't understand. Then going oh, <laughs> and then figuring it out, and then repeating that same thing that you did <laughs> on your next game and go, oh my god, I did yeah, it I feel again. the same way. Uh, there we go. Okay. Drone Patrol. Drone so this Patrol. is a uh, last game. Before we get to the secret reveal of your brand new game, um, so tell us a little bit about uh, Drone Patrol. I know it's a, an extension of... Um, no, it's inspired by uh, Raptor that we can see in the background uh, just to the side <laughs> yep. of you, which is we touched on this earlier. So um, tell us a little bit about Drone Patrol. Yeah, clearly inspired by, by Raptor in that it's a drone and you're shooting st stuff straight down with a laser beam. But uh, it was yeah. uh, made possible after I looked at MK Smith's demo. Um, when, when he showed that really easy to understand, I looked at the code like, I get this. I see what he did. It made sense. <laughs> and uh, like I could completely adapt this into a parallax scrolling 7800 version of Raptor. So that's kind of where I started. <clears throat> and uh, yeah. at, at that point, um, it was, again, just kind of trying new things as I went along and seeing what worked. So there's a lot of things that I put into the game and took back out. Um, there actually is something I just removed from the most recent version after doing more hardware testing. There was a uh, formerly scrolling <laughs> text at the bottom of the screen that came up occasionally. Oh. I removed that. <clears throat> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, hitting the, I, I was really pushing the limits with this game. <clears throat> the, uh, yeah, the parallax scrolling is great. The uh, number of enemies on the screen and uh, there's a lot to watch out for. There's a lot to keep track of, this, this, um, which is always fun. In a this game. game is pretty frantic. I, you, you definitely have to keep <laughs> moving. It's, uh, you can't hardly blink sometimes if you, if you don't want to die. <laughs> But uh, yeah. something I had not done before was to create a multi-stage game that had boss battles that you could use. I mean, that was part of the goal, too, that I thought would be fun to try. So I created uh, 10 unique um, boss battles in this game. Each one of those is basically a standalone 16K game. I mean, they're each their own game within yes. the code, pretty much. <clears throat> this game turned out to use probably around 300K of the 512K round or so. Wow. So it is still pretty massive, even though it doesn't actually use the entire uh, amount of space that I have available to me. <clears throat> uh, so with this many games under your development belt, what keeps programming games for the 2600 and 7800 fresh? <clears throat> Do you try and challenge yourself with each new game, uh, like different techniques or, you know, parallax scrolling or... S what what keeps you motivated uh, when making new games? Um, 
I, I think it really is the challenge of it. I, I'm not sure I mentioned before, I, I've been in information technology my whole career. Um, I'm an IT analyst. I've done a lot of data analytics and uh, doing this type of stuff is kind of what uh, fires the retina ends in my brain to make me happy. Um, I just I just really <laughs> enjoy programming in general. So, I mean, I've also worked on applications in the past too. I've, I've made some applications at work too, really just kind of for myself with my department, just <clears throat> doing analytical stuff for, for reporting or just analytics in general, just to make our jobs easier. So uh, doing that kind of stuff just makes me happy and it's fun. So uh, yeah, icing on the cake is making it into something fun. And uh, these platforms yeah. are just kind of what I know now. I mean, this is what I started doing and this is what I continue to enjoy doing. So I, I know it was mentioned too, if I considered Lynx or Jaguar, I've really not considered any other platform because these are just kind of my favorite. And uh, I've already pretty right. experienced with these and enjoying working on these. So foreseeable future, these are probably the two platforms you're going to see games from. Um, yeah, and you know, why not stick with ones you know that you're good with and just keep challenging yourself? Um, so on June 3rd, you set up a website for your games at maximusgames.us. Um, after shutting down your previous website, bjars.com, that ran from 2006 to this year, can you talk a little bit about the motivation behind putting together a website with all your games and shutting down the previous one? Like, what was the... Why trend? What was the transition, and how are the websites different? Um, the original website, honestly, it was, it was just getting dated. I mean, I originally created that in 2006 using the Microsoft front page, um, and uh, maintaining it and updating it, it really just needed to be written, written from scratch, and it was just too much effort for something that I'm not sure was really used or visited that often. Um, all the information on that right. site is readily available elsewhere. Um, and it'll be for it'll be mm. forever available on the Wayback Machine on the Internet Archive, right? So anybody wants to download anything, True. and I also on the Atari Age forums uh, shared a, a tar file of the entire website zipped up. So so okay. anybody okay. wants the content of VJARs or BRs, whatever that, how you want to pronounce it, <laughs> um, it, you can download it with a search on the Atari Age forums. And, uh, That's good because some some websites go offline and they're just lost <clears> forever. <throat> into the ether that's good that you you archived it and and it's available on archive.org when people yeah. want to so uh, hopefully that website never goes away oh my god do i ever use it for looking back at old things that don't exist anymore when i need to do interviews yeah. for things that existed 20 years ago and they're just long long gone so i wanted maximus games to just be a, a much more simple site that uh, was, was simply directs you to games i've made um, the, the older website had all kinds of stuff on there related to um, programming and, and hacking and lots lots of information. It felt like a 90s web page. I mean, it was just a conglomeration of all <laughs> kinds of unrelated things. I just wanted to start over. Right, right. I'm, yeah, I, I can understand that if it gets out of hand and gets out of date and then you just... You're kind of embarrassed by how out of date it is, and it's like, oh, I don't have time or the inclination to update everything. Just start again, keep it clean. And this one has your name of the of your you know production company, let's say, of, of, which is Maximus Games. Is and your logo. When did you come up with that and the Maximus Games um, name? Um, I, I really just wanted to come up with a a name that wasn't just my own name that I could slap on there because I thought it looked cool. I mean, I, you see that in a lot of a lot of games where there'll just be a splash screen with like like a, a logo and a, a game company name. I'm not a company. I mean, I'm not a registered trademark. <laughs> <laughs> That's just part of my yeah. handle. So um, there might be another Maximus Games out there somewhere that actually owns a copyright to that name. I'm not sure. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just I just thought it looked cool. I designed a logo that kind of looked like the old uh, Nintendo 64 logo, sort of. Or no, I'm sorry, GameCube. Kind of like the GameCube. GameCube one. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a good logo. And I put it uh, under your uh, under I your name that. on the screen as yeah. well. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so you've had a number of games sold through the Atari Age store. Um, can you talk about the experience of people buying your games and the feedback you've gotten either online or in person as, let's say, PRGE, of people who have, like, bought your cartridge? 
Um, I can't say that I got a lot of feedback at PRG. I didn't run into a whole lot of people that uh, that talked to me about my games, but uh, that was a whole. I mean, that experience was was amazing either way. I mean, I, I, it was really fun meeting you there, yeah. and I'm gonna be there again this year. <laughs> oh, sweet! Yay! Yay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and it was very easy to find you. Your uh, shirt said. Uh, had your name on it, so I was like, oh, yeah, excellent. Like, <laughs> everybody should wear your, their shirts with their names on it. Yeah, them. I thought that was pretty amusing. I still have the shirt. Maybe I'll wear it in this fall. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. I should have worn that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> there you uh, go. <clears throat> but uh, mostly for feedback, uh, it's just been whatever people put on the forums, and I read and respond to. Um, <clears throat> that's been my primary way to get that. Mm. Um. So you've developed a piece of software for Windows called Maximus 78, mm -hmm. which is a front end for the A7800 Atari 7800 emulator. Can you tell us a bit more about the software and why you decided to develop it? Um, really, I made that for myself and just was kind of hoping maybe somebody else would find it useful too. It's a, it's a graphical interface for A7800, which is a Mike Sarno's fork of main that is specific to the Atari 7800. Um, a7800 is a command line only um, emulator, so if you need to add a lot of different options on there, it's uh, quite cumbersome. So the the, uh, the application I wrote will automatically load any directory that you have. Uh, it will find all the A78 files. You can add screenshots or box art images or whatever you want to go along with it. But, Primarily, it's just an easy nice. way to, to see a list of games, double click on it to launch it, and not have to worry about pulling up the command line, remembering the directory structure, remembering the file name, and all the different command line switch options. Yeah. It, for me, it just makes it so much easier in my development process to find and launch games instantly. Mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> Nice. Um, so we touched on PRG. That was the first time you'd ever gone to PRG. It was last it year. Was. Um, and it was awesome meeting you in person. I always love meeting people, you know, in person. I mean, online's great, but in person's even better. Yeah, um, it was a lot of fun. How did you find? How did you find the experience? And and had you gone to other retro gaming expos? <laughs> I have never been areas? to any gaming expo. That was the first time I've ever done that. <clears throat> oh, I, I mentioned yeah. earlier too about you know I, I'm finally getting really close to the empty nester stage. I've got a, I, I've got three boys, um, <clears throat> two, two of them wow. don't live with me anymore. Um, and my wife and I are finally starting to find that free time that we've always desired. So, um, <laughs> yes. More games. So I'll have, I'll have more <laughs> opportunities at this point in my life to go to shows like this, where in the past I really did not. Oh, sweet. There's a That's family awesome. and job um, obligations. So yeah, I'm excited about yeah. about the future and uh, <clears throat> everything that we have uh, coming forward. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to going again this fall. Oh yeah, me too. We always <laughs> love. It's a highlight of our year, and I mean, once you go to PRG, you're kind of spoiled for retro <laughs> game conventions. It's it's a pretty special <laughs> one, which which is great. Um, so I think I think let me just make sure. I think it is time that we get to the main event. In which is the a reveal of your new game. Um, I think we'll just start it up and then uh, talk about it. Mm. So, sure. it, this is <clears throat> an exclusive. Okay, now I hope I have it on yeah. here. I think I do. I hope, uh, I hope you do too. <laughs> I'm just going to switch away for a second. <laughs> Excellent. Get it just up. make sure. You don't give it all away? Oh, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> secret new game? It's not. Oh, nice. there it is. Yeah, secret new game. <laughs> in, it, in all caps? I hid it from myself. <laughs> Okay, so um, I think we don't want to reveal it till it comes on the screen. Okay, so do you want me to... I'm going to switch away and then you start it up. Press it. Yeah. Down. Press it. Now? Yeah, that's not the game. Go down and go for it. Okay. Nice title screen there. Who is that? Zero Page Homebrew! <laughs> Thank you so much for that. 
Can people guess what it is yet? Maybe by that character running across the screen. <laughs> Got the Atari Age logo. I think this is going to hit uh, a lot of nostalgic feelings for people. <laughs> okay, press play. Oh, wait. Maximus Games, there's your logo. And the new website URL. Alpine Avenger ah. by Steve Engelhart. There is the so game. Cute. So, uh, this is a port. What is this a port <clears throat> of, Steve? Um, this was, I would say, more inspired by than a port of because it doesn't match it exactly. True. It's, uh, it's the old Windows 3.0 game called Ski Free. Um, that's what, what inspired this game. And uh, this, I had no idea that I was actually going to make this game until I, I was. Honestly, what I really wanted to work on was figuring out 320B graphics. I had never made a game using 320B. Okay. I mean, that allows, <clears throat> uh, I think I used uh, 12 colors on some of these sprites. And uh, wow. so I started with kind of creating a sprite sheet with all the uh, ski free sprites because I thought that's just the first game that popped in my head when I wanted to try to make some sample sprites. And uh, as I started making them, and uh, I thought, well, maybe I'll just see if I can mix this into a game. <laughs> so it, uh, <laughs> so yeah, it really started off as an experiment with a graphics experiment in the 7800 to see what it was, what I could was capable of, and what would actually work within a game. So there's a lot of 320B graphics in this game, a lot of multicolored yep. sprites. <clears throat> Some. Can you? Can you explain what uh, 320B graphics is and what its capabilities are or limitations? Um, I, yeah, I might not remember all the technical details behind it, but uh, normally in a, um, games are made in what's called 160A, which is really a three color plus background color. So you're generally limited to three colors on a sprite. The uh, higher resolution mode of the 7800 will allow uh, up to, I think it's 12 colors on a sprite. Um, so the main skier character of this and a lot of the uh, obstacles and other sprites in the game can use like between 8 and 12 colors. So something... Right. And you can see the skier is very colorful. Mm -hmm. Lots of colors going on there. So the, the game does differ from the original. The original game, uh, you'd start skiing and then you could choose a, a tree slalom or a regular slalom or just a freestyle game. Um, I, I was not able to fit everything from the original game into this one. I mean, as I started, I started realizing, that, yeah, it's going to have to scale back. You'd think that a Windows 3.0 game, you could you could fit everything <laughs> onto the 7800, but you, I really, I really yeah. couldn't. So um, I simplified the game. I mean, the whole game is basically the same as the freestyle mode of the original Ski Free. <clears throat> the object really is to just hit all the ski jumps that, as, you, as many as you can and score as many points as you can. But the most iconic part of this game really is uh, the Yeti from the original, which I named the Alpine Avenger in this game. Um, the, <laughs> the original one is still undefeated. It was impossible to actually beat the original Ski Free. The Yeti would always eat you. <laughs> so uh, I tried not to disappoint awesome. in this game. And that uh, it, will, yep. it will chase you and will eventually get you. It's unavoidable. And Got the dog. Are you supposed to, to get faster. the dog? Yeah, I'm supposed to. Let's say you're petting the dog and not running over the dog. Oh. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> what? Um, let's let's go over some of the different game modes. Uh, the practice, which Tanya's playing right now. There's also freestyle and chase. So you can can you talk about a bit about each of the different sure. um, um, options? The practice mode. Uh, uh, I mean, it, if you really want a super easy game where you just want to hit ski jumps in practice, I mean, the collision detection is completely turned off for the first uh, three minutes of the game or until you travel, I think, 20, 20 meters or miles okay. or whatever you want to call that. But, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. it's really just a practice. And uh, it also was extremely useful in the development process where I could start a mode where I wasn't going to immediately crash when I was trying to test different aspects of the game. So leaving it in there just... Was, uh, it seemed like it might be somebody, something somebody would enjoy. But the real crux of the game is the yeah. two other modes, the uh, just freestyle and chase. And really, I would think of those as more like a easy and hard. So free, freestyle right. is kind of the standard mode of the game. Um, <clears throat> the challenge really is just getting as many points as you can and crashing as little as possible and getting a high score. 
Um, the, the chase mode adds the uh, adds the Yeti as a constant threat. So from the very <laughs> beginning of the game, you're going to be chased. If you crash or uh, go too slow or go sideways on the mountain a little bit too much, um, you're very likely to get caught and eaten before you get to the finish line. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's go back to... Freestyle mode. Yeah, this is too easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fine. Fine. So, yeah, freestyle. So when you take a jump, you can do a couple different moves when you're in the air. So you can turn end over end, or <laughs> you can also go sideways as well. Yep, yeah, so when you when you um, start to jump, you need to push... A, repeatedly push up or repeatedly push down to go slower or go faster. The faster you go, you can go up to 40 kph as you're, if you're going straight down and keep pushing down to go to the maximum speed. You will be in the air longer. And uh, there is an auditory cue from the, uh, the sound effect that kind of has an arc. You can kind of tell when you hit, when you're on the downswing. Ah. So it should help a little bit in determining when you need to get back into position to safely land. But when you're in the air, Yes, you can push either left or right to spin sideways, or you can push up and down to spin head over heels. If you do a, if you right. do a full rotation in both directions, you will get a, a hundred yep. bonus style points. If you don't, if you uh -huh. don't do a full rotation in both directions, then you'll get ten points for every head over heels flip and five points for every sideways flip. Mm. The way I've been doing it is I've been counting the joystick movements. Yep. Like one, two, three, one, two, three is like a full forward flip. So that's another way, besides the audio cues, you can kind of keep yep. track of where you are in the air. And also visually, you look different when you're going to land as opposed to, obviously being upside down in the air is not the best way to land as yep. a skier. <laughs> so uh, there are a couple of people that have seen the game because I needed some help at the very beginning. So. Obviously, since I included music from Hexaflight, um, he has seen the game because he helped me with the Poké yep. music. And uh, Carl G, um, I think is in chat, um, he also helped. Yep. He did a lot of uh, testing for me and suggestions, and I do appreciate his help with this too. Yeah. And um, I also did some some testing and. Uh, you did as well. Yeah. Feed f feedback and you know visual things that were going going crazy, and I. I uh, bugged you a lot about the <laughs> direction direction of the ski lifts and and uh, relative speeds of things and uh, yeah it just got more and more refined and and it looks absolutely uh, amazing now yeah and i'm certainly open to more changes i'm planning on posting this uh it, it's it's going to be no later than tomorrow morning uh, i'll make a post and i'll publicly publicly share this with everybody on the uh, 7800 Excellent. programming forums on charlie bridge and you've also done a um instruction uh, manual with it for people who are unfamiliar with the game or I mean this is a little is different than ski free so it's going to play play differently as well yeah it does play a little bit differently um, so did you play a lot of ski free back in the days I, I know did that come with <clears throat> Windows or was it a downloadable like shareware thing it was one of the Microsoft released four what they called entertainment packs for a Windows 3.0 and 3.1, and it was one of those. Okay. It probably was the first one. Oh, okay. And so it, it was among all the other really simple card games. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, I I, play, I definitely played it when I, and probably 1991-ish, when I, when this. So that's out. probably why a lot of people would have exposure to it because it came with different Microsoft Windows packages. And it very well could have been included with later builds, or later releases of Windows 3.1. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Um, so I have a question from the chat from Caffeman 2 d mm -hmm. What type of schedule do you try to keep balancing life and homebrew hours and mental energy? <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good question, and I should uh, start including that, <clears throat> talking with developers, because it is... It is challenging whether you you have a family like you've like you've said before that soon uh, your your uh, kids are moving out of the house you'll have more free time but you know there's job there's other responsibilities there's life there's family um, there's just downtime so how how do you do it how do you maintain it um, really is kind of trying to multitask as best as I can um, I 
Thank you very much to my uh, my wife, bless her soul, for putting up with me spending so much time on my laptop <laughs> and on the, on the couch while the TV's on when I'm supposed to be watching a show with her. <laughs> so we, we, well, that's pretty good. You're able to at, at least be with her. Some people, you know, they have to program in a specific room. That's yeah. good. Yeah, I've done a, a lot of these games have been programmed with a laptop in my lap and my recliner. <laughs> <laughs> Best way to program, so, right? <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's just spending a lot of time in the evening just uh, doing more than one thing at once. I mean, it's, it's hard to focus on okay. more than one thing, but yeah, I do spend sometimes yeah. hours in the evening, you know, in, the, in that room with that laptop in my lab. Yeah. Because so I know when I'm trying to program, I can't have any music mm. on, I can't have any distractions because I just, my code slows down to zero <laughs> <laughs> when there's like anything else going on because I'm so easily distracted by stuff. So I just have to be in my the zph office and just focused on the one thing yeah you lock out the cats too yeah oh no the cats well sometimes you know atari is able to stay on the couch and be, <laughs> be quiet calm. he's calm and sleeps <laughs> no but... he can only come if he stays nice and calm yeah otherwise yeah. out you get nope no good so Fatoko says hitting the dog gives points i know uh, <laughs> well, i don't i don't i don't think we hit the dog we we pet the dog as we go by sure uh, yeah. ski through a dog and it will send him scurrying home <laughs> um chel stony mouse so says the snowman doesn't mess around so there's some characters there's a novice skier who's uh uh, doing the pizza wedge, <laughs> going down the hill. Doing the yep. pizza wedge, I <laughs> <Yeah>. love it. <laughs> um, and have we seen the uh, the uh, Yeti, the abominable snowman? The, what is he named in this? Oh, uh, the Alpine Avenger. Yeah, the Alpine Avenger. He's named yeah you won't the, in freestyle yeah. mode. You won't see him until after uh, three minutes have passed, where you've got twenty in distance. Oh, okay. So ramping up to it. But yeah. we definitely... No, we got him. He oh, killed me. He... Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I no, it he back. definitely killed me. Okay. He got me immediately. The skier doesn't handle moguls very well. Apparently. No, this this skier <laughs> skis like, apparently like I ski. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, there are moguls scattered around the downhill slope. Hitting the, hitting one will slow you down. Well, yeah, yep, definitely slow you down. Um, so you've probably played a ton of this game now. <laughs> <laughs> I have many hours. Are you an ex? Are you an expert at it? Are you an expert at all your games, or are you just like I know how to program, I don't know how to play? Um, some of them, I'd, I'd say I'm probably expert level at. Like I, I could probably take anybody in Dungeon Stalker at this point. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, this game I put a lot of time into, but I wouldn't say I'm an expert. I mean, I, I started on this. I guess. I mean, the, the development. Yeah. It took me about what maybe three months to develop this one. Yeah. Um. Let's see if I have any more questions for you. Let's see. I don't think I do. So, anything else you want to um, add about Alpine Avenger? Um, it's being released tomorrow-ish. Yep, I will uh, release um, it in the, in, uh, in the morning tomorrow. And uh, yeah, I'll provide as many details as I can in, in the forum thread yep. to explain it. And, uh, I hope everybody likes it. I had a lot of fun making it. And, uh, That's awesome. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any other skiing games on the 7800 on there. <laughs> no, another, another uh, genre film. <laughs> sure. <laughs> skiing games yeah. and it's and it's probably fun and relaxing more it than is. anything else it right? is yeah it's yeah. kind of a, a relaxing game it depends how you play it really yeah. like you can play it in many different it's ways quite the opposite of oh, 100 points for that. <laughs> in that respect yes <laughs> yeah. that is a lot going oh here it comes here comes the alpine avenger oh, you got to no. speed up how do i speed up press down no it down. doesn't go any faster what no it's, keep oh, pushing no. down well keep you're dead down. now Keep, num, 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 keep num. pushing down. <laughs> he, he ate you. He's he's so all excited now. Funny! Oh my goodness! <laughs> now he's picking his teeth. <laughs> I, I missed that last time. The picking with the ski. So you've got distance, Pull. time, speed, and style That's points. That's awesome. So there's uh, a lot to keep track of, and I guess style equals score, <laughs> really. Yeah, and style is what was used go. in the original game, so I just kind of stuck with that for nostalgia. But yeah, it's really just score. that makes sense. And um, this uses the Atari Vox um, for score. And does it have sound? Uh, some voices in it as um, well? This game does not have speech. Um, the Atari Vox is, would be used just for high score saving. It will save your high scores. 
Okay. It did say some things when ZPH was on the screen. It was just saying some garbage, so that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that it's some other games where I, d I don't know how the crossover triggers, but it must be like accessing or initializing the Atari box. It could box be. I mean, the, the Atari box code is enabled in this game in order to allow the high score saving. But there's there's no right. actual speech yeah. program into it. So. Yeah. And I know once uh, you made a Atari Vox tester, which was very cool. So people can like trigger speech on their Atari Vox. Yep. Yeah, I did the. I yeah. made an updated version when I was working on Drone Patrol as well that I, that I released. So nice. yeah, if you want to listen to a lot of the old speech nice. phrases I've made, those are out there on, on the forums. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so anything else you'd like to add that we haven't covered? Uh, any upcoming games or <laughs> that you want to talk about or that we haven't covered that you are still working on right now? Um, I don't have any new projects that I'm working on, really. Um, there's a couple others that I started revisiting. You know, earlier in the year, I, when I did uh, Gate Racer and Bomb Barrage and Monkey Drop, you know, they're re remaking Primate Plunge and Bombs Away. But that's when I was kind of going yeah. back through my old... 2600 catalog. There's still a couple other ones that I was wanting to fix up or redo or make better. That was Inferno and Diamond Drop. <clears throat> I know uh, yeah. Thomas Yench was making a duet type game, so I'm probably not yes. going to bother <laughs> to go back to Diamond Drop. Yeah, his, his, is, his is really good. This is really yeah, good. That's really good. <laughs> but but uh, the other one, putting out the fire, what was that um, one it, called? Uh, it was inspired by Towering Inferno. I called it Inferno. Um, yeah, I'd love to see that one updated because I, I was playing the games today uh, in preparation and putting them on the cartridges and um, that that one's a lot of fun and I think that would, would be good to update. Yeah, no, I, I've got that one. There are a lot of updates to it. I updated it with the, you know, the menus and the splash screens and everything. I've not publicly shared that because the game itself yep. hasn't been updated that much yet. Um, I'm just trying okay, to be inspired yeah. about what I want to do differently with it. So I'd, that yeah. one might be the next one, um, some kind of uh, update of my old Inferno game. Nice. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, so it's been an absolute pleasure yeah, <laughs> talking with you at extended length about your uh, programming career and uh, all the games <laughs> you've uh, made over the years. Um, so. Uh, Good luck in the future making more games. I'm always uh, eager to see what game you're working on next. And uh, it's uh, been a lot of fun going down memory lane. Yeah, this has been a lot of <laughs> fun. The... Thank you guys so much for inviting me to do this. I, I feel humbled by all the other people that have done this before me. The quite prolific uh, programmers you've had on this show in the past. So I feel quite humbled. Yeah, and <laughs> and I, I count you among, uh, among them. You've been doing it for <clears throat> over 20 years now, programming and uh a big part of the Atari Age forums and pushing forward Atari 2600 and 7800 games. Uh, it's it's awesome to have you on and to talk to you once again. So we'll say, see you at PRGE. I will be there. Uh, we can't wait. Yeah. And it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll look for your t-shirt or whatever you're wearing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so thanks for hanging out with us today. Oh, uh, let me just make sure there's no more questions. Oh, Vitoko has one more question. Is the music responding to the game action? I'm, uh, he's referring to um, Alpine oh. Avenger. Uh, the Pokey music, no. That is just a, a track that continuously plays. It actually has nothing to do with what's happening in the game. So. Okay. There we go. Okay, thank yep. you so much. And uh, we will see you online. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. was a real pleasure. <laughs> oh, gotta take this out. Oh, yeah. Sorry, kid. Ah, always fun to talk to people. Yes. Ah, Let but stick cool. around. Yeah, we do have. We one have a surprise. More surprise. One more thing. You gotta stay. Uh, we're going to combine this surprise. It is July, and we haven't. Sorry. Excuse oh, me. Music in the background. Uh, we haven't given away a coaster oh. for July yet. That's part of it. So we have these two new coasters here that we might want to give away. One is pink, one is white. Oh, Atari oh, isn't... Well, I wouldn't say white. It's blue and sparkly. Blue and sparkly. Both are sparkly. Okay. One is blue with black zero page, and the other one 
has sort of a back, black zero page and sparkly interior. It is a little sparkly, this one. Yes. It, it, it's, you, it's almost, the zero page is almost unreadable, but it, anyway. Coasting with James and Tanya. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. This is the coasting part of it. Coasting. Ooh, so we yeah. are going to give away a coaster, but. Okay. They're very sparkly. We have a surprise. We got blue and we got pink. For everyone. Uh, we do. If you would like to go get the surprise. Get the surprise? Should I bring the surprise in or should yeah. I let the surprise come in on their own? Um, on their own, maybe. I'll switch the camera. How about that? Okay, the camera switched. Okay, the surprise was asleep. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good. Oh my goodness, right there. Right there? Do you have it on the couch? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> what is this? Oh, my. Oh, oh he dancing. just woke up. He's like, what is going on? Who dare disturbs my slumber? Oh, oh baby. Come back. Come back. Come here. Come here. Where are you going? Where are you going? Oh, he's stumbling around. Oh, he's going back. He's going back he's to like, the bathroom. You woke me up. I gotta go back to sleep. I haven't got my sleep yet. Um, <laughs> he'll so, be back. He'll be back. <laughs> so the um, the coaster. Yes. Question. Oh, is what Vitoko said. Yeah. It is guessing the name. Don't guess the name. Think about it in your head. Don't write anything yet. Oh, thank you very much, nostalgic. He is absolutely a sweetheart. He is so gentle and he cuddles with us oh first my day gosh. he was able to um be with atari yeah the they, got, first day. they got along like a house on fire yeah yeah <laughs> immediately <laughs> yeah not one hiss no they're just like okay yeah yep you're cool yeah you're cool <laughs> uh, you can try name? you will try it is what a geeky name? name i'll give you that hint are you sleeping yeah, oh, come here, baby. Now, you know what? Atari went into his food. Oh, of course. So it is a geeky name. You will be able to guess it. Yeah, maybe bring the food in here or something. <laughs> or just put it up somewhere. Um, yeah, bring that kitten in here. Come over. And put him on the couch. He's so sleepy. Oh, he's a sleepy he must, cat. He must have been fast asleep. Oh, that's not good for tonight. Are you going to be up all over the place? Yeah. There we go. Oh, Aww. he's behind the chat. Okay, don't guess oh. yet. Okay, we're going to guess. When I type in go... Yeah, you can't try Vitoko. Oh. When I type in go into the chat, you guess the names. Oh. Uh, only guess... Hi. We'll, we'll just go nuts because it's guessing names. It's, it's guessing names. So the first person to guess the name gets the coaster. Yeah. Remember, if you've won a coaster, you can't get it again. Yes. Now, it is a geeky name. Yes. Uh, let's say computer console geeky, related. Geeky, yeah. Computer console related. Video game console Re computer adjacent, related. yes. Yeah, that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, I have to stay quiet on this one. Yes. Unless you desperately want another coaster and no one's guessing it, but we'll tell you when yeah. you can do that, when when it's... Um, we'll allow for a second... We'll allow for a second round. Second yeah. coaster. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Look at this baby. Oh... See his little oh, face? He's so his adorable. Black nose. He's got a little black nose. Yeah. He's a cow cat. Yes. You can stay up here for a little bit. Okay. Are you ready, everyone? And, oh, he's, and he's, he's going chasing to see his after. Brother. He's chasing after. Okay. Atari. Go. You can type in the chat what you think the name is. And you can type as many as you want. Not oh. Robin. That's not computer related. <laughs> Batman and Robin game? Um. Bitmap, Scanline, mm -hmm. MOS, Pokey, no. Good guesses. Good guesses. Very he had good guesses. Some of those on his uh, short list. We had MOS on the list. <laughs> yeah. We had Pokey on the list. Bit. Didn't have oh. Bit on the list. Didn't have Bitmap. Bite. I think I had Bite I, on the I list. I think you had Bite on the yep. list. Keep on guessing. Come on back in. Come on on the floor. Come back Come on. in. Come in, little baby. It's very quiet. All of Stella it. was on the list. Yep. 
It's really quiet all of a sudden. Yeah. Remember you can... Yeah, he's not talking. He's not meowing. Pokey would have been a good one. Yeah. Scan Scan line. line. It's a bit long. Uh, It's male, but it doesn't matter. Well, I guess it does a little bit, but not really. Raster was on the list. Tia was on the list. (laughs) Tom Tom and Jerry Jerry. were not on the list. No. Um, Sure. But I did think about those names. Yeah. Playfield. (laughs) You're Playfield. No, you're not Playfield. Hi. But you're you're dancing all around it. Spot is a good one. Spot, I think, was on the list, but it was just like a super missile. Missile, player one, player two. Oh, watch that cat. He's going to start dragging things down. No, he's trying to get his food. No. Stacy. Stacy. Sid. Crow Seven Seven got it. Sid, Sid, come here. Come here, Sid the cat. Come here, Sid. He's run off. Why does he want to be in the hallway? I don't know. Congratulations, Prow7. Please contact me in, on the Atari Age forums. Uh, now you get to pick which cart, which uh, coaster you want. Be blank. That's right. <laughs> be blank. He uh, does all his thinking in the B blank area. So I'm going to write your name. And so hold up the coasters for Prow7. We got pink and we got blue, sparkly and sparkly. And I'll switch it to actually, sorry, go oh. up to the camera up there. Okay. Or pink. Blue or pink? Pick your poison, Pro Seven. Lisa wasn't Vic Two. No, it wasn't Vic Two. Yeah, I had a C sixty four, and uh, he does he does chat a lot, so. He makes a lot of noises like the uh, Sid Chip does. Prow says he'll take the blue. All right. Excellent. Good choice. If you give me that, I'll put this on it. Excellent. So, congratulations, Prow7. Your name is now on the coaster. Please contact me in the Atari Age forums or directly through here. Commodore would be a good name. Some rumbling. Oh, the rumbling is the fans. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's. Or it could be the Abominable Snowman. Let's turn that off the background yeah um there's fans because it's 32 degrees here why he is not coming in i don't know He's the very whole sleepy. time come here. here he comes maybe play i'll get you come here come here we're gonna teach you how to bring bells yes see if you understand ringing bells so let's get the bell out okay or both bells We'll just get one for now. We'll let him watch. Okay. Hopefully he takes some interest. If somebody wants to trigger the treat uh, time. We don't need to do treat time. Oh, just do it? We'll just do it. Okay. We yeah. won't do it. Okay. Right. So this is instructional and, and off he goes. Hey, Atari. S- Sid. <laughs> Sid, you got to come learn. Oh, we did. Well, oh. it was too early before, but uh, we got the new kitty a couple days ago. He spends more time in attack or decay mode. Right now he's in decay mode. So good. That's oh, there we go. Oh, he is uh, three, three months, three and a half, three months. March twenty first, he was born on. Yeah. There you go. So three and a half. It's a treat for you. Did you hear the bell? You he's see what he's he did? gotta watch. Yeah. Sid Barrett, uh, he's also known as Sid Vicious. Yeah. Well, I just call him Mr. Vicious. Mr. Vicious. Yeah. He is not vicious at all. Oh. Oh, there we go. You hear the bell, and you yeah. got a treat. Yeah. Yeah, you'll learn. And then we'll pitch you against each other. <laughs> no, treat time gives everyone treats. He's, he's, he doesn't get much time in this room. He seems to be sniffing around this the room. This room is new to him. Yeah. So he's exploring right now. Yeah. Sid, Sid gentle. gentle. Oh, yeah, he is Sid Gentle. Oh, he's he so saw that. soft. And he heard it. That's, he heard it. That's important, oh. too. Oh, he's going to attack Atari. He's wiggling his bum, and he's slowly attacking him. Oh, you guys can't see. There we go. Hi. Hi, little baby. Oh, you want to come up? You want to watch? Watch from above. And give the th- thumbs up and thumbs down. Hi, do you want a treat? You haven't got a treat. You want to put a treat I'll there? A treat there, please. Right here. Sid, right here. Sid, Sid, look, look. 
Oh my god. Ring the bell. There we go. <laughs> soft Sid. Yeah, he is a yeah. soft Sid. That that's in reference to a software based. Yeah. Um, um, oh yeah. Audio emulation of the Sid chip. That's funny. Atari loves Sid. They have played. They played on the first day, chasing each other around. Yeah. Batting at each other. Very gently too. So gentle. Yeah. Atari defers everything to him. Yeah. If he's doing something, Atari will back off. It's like, oh, you want to eat my food? You can eat my food. He's been on. Sid's been on the couch cuddling with us, and Atari's just on the floor. Yeah. Normally, Atari um, cuddles with us on the couch. It is his third, third? second, second day home. Second day home. Yeah. Yeah. Third. No, we got it on Sunday. Sunday. So third day home. It's yeah. Tuesday today. Yeah. yeah. So it's three days to us. Yeah. And he runs around the house like crazy. He's up and down the stairs. Yeah. You want to ring the bell? You gonna try? You don't have to. Show him how to do it. See? Oh. Oh, oh better give him one too. Oh. There you go. <laughs> he got one after ringing the bell, so that's good. That's something. Yeah, they both really like each other. They're very comfortable with each other. Yeah. They haven't like slept side by side yet. Um a couple more and then they'll they'll just walk around each other no hissing he's still chewing up Is he's it? got a tiny mouth yeah it does it'll take him longer to eat oh good there you go here bring it can you ring the bell <laughs> can you ring the bell bring it he's <laughs> smacking him in the face bring it can you ring it ring the bell there, good. Give him one. Bring it. There, see, see how it's wrong. <laughs> oh, oh, give it to him. Give it to him. Give it to him. Yeah, he pawed yeah, at yeah. it. Here, good Here. kitty. Good, good kitty. kitty. Good kitty. Yeah, he pawed at it. You just gotta it. start slow. Yeah. Try with the blue bell. That's it. It's the bell that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, he will have a different bell. See, he's just he, chewed it in half yeah. he's a slow eater yeah it's gonna be a, a rough sid the final fantasy character bit by bit yes he makes his way through i think oh, oh. <laughs> he's like no that was mine oh no that was mean he didn't no. mean to no here that's actually yours yeah he 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 This. So use your paw. Pick this. Use your paw. Hit it. Get ready to give him one right away. Hit it. Use your paw. Sid? No. Nope. He's lost, lost interest. interest. <laughs> <laughs> That's when competition began. Dun dun dun. There you go. So okay, last that's one. It. That's it. He's there had enough. <laughs> yeah, more than enough, I think. Yeah. Instructional amount. Yeah. What uh, we I, what we found with Sprite was he didn't get it right away, and then it it percolated for a day, and then he figured it out. Got it on the second day, Sprite. Yeah. I think Sprite was a bit older. You think? Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. Sprite was a bit yeah. older. We're not gonna force it. He'll figure it out. <laughs> no. Once if he like even if he starts ringing the bell, he's gonna eat it so slowly. Yeah. Uh, Atari will just destroy him yeah that's okay you need to learn fast Sid. i have a gambling addiction <laughs> needs to be satiated that's right shit let law <laughs> uh, uh sid he's a cute cat yeah he's yeah. super cute mm -hmm. we atari, love him already atari seems much happier with a companion yeah atari he was, was a bit sad atari was yeah. crying after eating and wandering around the house crying yeah. he's not cried once in the past three days yeah since Sid has been here. He's yeah. been very happy. He's been watching him, following him around. Yeah. Teaching him. I don't know. I don't, know <laughs> I don't what think he's, he's been teaching him. Nothing him. good. Nothing good, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So it's um, been good. So we thought we'd introduce you to Sid today at the mm -hmm. end of the show. And keep it as a surprise. Now he's crying. Now he's crying in the end. He's room. very vocal. Oh yeah. If he's like most kids online, he'll be beating the veterans after two weeks of play. <laughs> Pretty much. That's Pretty right. much. Yeah. So let's see what's coming up on the show uh on what day is it today? Tuesday. On Friday, we're going to be playing Galagish and Tony, if that arrives. Yes. 
It should by then. Oh, I'll good. have to go check the mailbox. Good, good, good. Um, and then next Tuesday, Stellar Drive Mars, an exclusive work in progress update. It's actually an exclusive final version. I need to update that too. It's done. Um, plus some more 2600 games. Nice, nice. Um, if it gets cool a little bit, we'll be doing the last day of the 7840th anniversary Yay. classic gaming countdown. Oh, nostalgic. Thank you for continuing to share your cats with us. Oh, oh we love to share our thank cats. Thank you for continuing to watch them. <laughs> yeah, and to enjoy, you know, watching our little kitties yeah, grow up. They're, they're, it's hard to play games in this house without being without the cats being here, too. So <laughs> Yes, yeah. they have to play their games <laughs> yes. as well. And we have uh, scheduled the developer spotlight on Lawrence Stavely mm. uh, from Reboot Games, Cyrano J, plus the exclusive world premiere of Last Strike mm. DX. Um that is on July 30th, so the end of this month. We'll be doing another developer spotlight. Yes. Uh, what day is that? I think it's a Tuesday as well. Tuesdays with Tanya. Ah, excellent. We <laughs> came up with that uh, last Friday. Oh, really? It only took really? seven years to come up with Tuesdays with Tanya. Was that airline? Or, <laughs> yeah, Tuesdays with Tanya. Ah. Or somebody in the chat. Somebody, yeah. Oh, there he is. There's Cyrano. <laughs> Hello, Cyrano. So we're very excited for another developer spotlight, um, and I would love to do one with Al coming up just before PRGE. I think that would be a lot of fun to see what's going on in the Atari age world. We've interviewed Al a lot, but I think like a full show dedicated to Al. Oh yeah. Would be a lot of fun. Yeah. I think he has, no, 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 no. No, no, he, he, he likes computing. He loves going on keyboards. He needs to learn keyboards are not for cats. No. Somehow he like froze your computer today, right? Just... Yeah, my work computer. He just jumped on it with all four paws. <laughs> Uh, he's doing it again. <laughs> oh my goodness. I bet he's too young. Yeah, I think he, he probably usually they have to get old enough for catnip, so. Let's just sample. Let's see if he sniffs it. Usually just babies just just, just go eh. Just give it get, just yeah. let him sniff it. Yeah. Here. I don't what, think it really affects them until they this? get older. Maybe he's, he'll be a juvenile delinquent. Oh. Oh. Oh, face is right in. No. No. You give it a big, give sniff? it a big sniff. Yeah, brain ain't wired up for the stuff yet. I don't think so. <laughs> no. Could a cat it's... use a twenty six hundred kids controller? <laughs> it have to be very. Boom! I'll pause. A kids controller is still pretty hard to press. Yeah. I think a button on a joystick is hi. the easiest thing to hi. press. Hi, hi, hi. Um, he does like oh, jumping sorry. up all the buttons though. It was oh. so funny. And, you can and use a keyboard, computer my, keyboard. My computer just shifted to the, the screen shifted to the left and it froze and yes. i'm like how did you do that how he just knows. i don't even know what he did he says work's over cat yeah, time cat time exactly isn't this guy adorable oh he's biting me he's biting you he's like don't pick me <laughs> not right now no i can see all the cat scratches down your leg there Ow. too oh no 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 no. <laughs> no 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 yeah no he's in a biting mood oh <gasps> oh he's very sharp okay you're very sharp Okay, calm down. Do we need to cut your t cut your nails? Yes. Little Amiga daggers. Joyboard. Daggers. I, I, track and field? Yes, he could use the track and yeah. field controller. Jump, 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 jump. So thanks for hanging out with us tonight. Big shout out to Steve Engelhart mm -hmm. for coming on for his developer spotlight. It was great uh, talking with him and mm -hmm. going through some of his games. Uh, thank you, Chalstoni Mal, Nostalgic, Dan AVC, Cyrano, Chalstoni Mal, Chitlitla, Gamma Dev, Vitoko. Dan AVC, Pro7, congratulations. No, on winning <laughs> uh, the coaster. Double Down, uh, Miss Command, Philip Meyer. Uh, uh, let's see. Caffman 2D. Zeptari, thank you for the questions. Mm. Rendered Ghost. Oh, oh my goodness. God, he's just getting it. <laughs> kittens. They're being kittens. Yep. Uh, Chili Nips. Anthony Nelms. Who else? S. Yardley. And everybody yes, else. Yes, thank you so much for joining us, Vitoko. Watching. Uh, we're going to throw over to whoever's broadcasting right now. Usually. Uh, what's his face? Usually, there's Maybe somebody. Maybe he's on vacation. Could be. Let's see. His name just escaped.
Pops gave to me there. Atari Beer Pong. Yay! So we're going to raid Atari Beer Pong. Oh, he put on the caps. Bad cat. <laughs> oh, did he? <laughs> yeah. Of course he did. Of course did. he did. Think of all the Amazon boxes Sid has to discover. Oh, he's got a world of discovery coming for him. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, we will be back on Friday with Erlen, I believe, again, because he filled in for Darcy yeah. last show. Yes, yes. So uh, thanks, everybody, and we'll be back on Friday. Yes, we will. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.